Madam Clerk, you give me the go. Okay, so ready. Uh, we're calling the city council member, the city council me meeting on February the 6th, 2023 to order. Will you please call roll? Yes, ma'am. Council member Burt. Mayor Coop. Here. Council member Lowing. Here. Council member Lithcott Hames. Here. Council member Stone. Here. Council member Tanaka. Here. And council member Vinker. Here. For the record, we have six present. Thank you. Um, we're going to start with our first item, which is a study session on Palo Alto Link, the city's new on-demand transit service. Hello. Hi. Uh, good evening, uh, Honorable City Council. I'm uh, Philip Kemi, Chief Transportation Official. I'm just waiting for the slides to get pulled up. Uh, joining me tonight is Nate Baird, who is our uh, Parking and Transit Manager. Um, and also in the audience, we have Garrett Brinker, who is um, from our contractor, VIA. He's their partnerships principal, and he can help to answer any um, detailed questions that you might have. Uh, okay, I see the PowerPoint is up now. Uh, so um, it is not letting me go to the next slide, though, unfortunately. All right. Uh, apologies. So uh, <laughs> it was not me, I don't think. Is, oh, OK. Looks like my clicker is working now. Um, so before diving into this uh, service discussion, I want to give a brief background and catch us up um, to how we got here and, and um, where the vision for this service came from. Uh, so. Back in 2017, a few key things occurred. Uh, VTA had set on their next network plan, which had called for some service cuts in Palo Alto. And um, I also was before the council presenting um, the Palo Alto um, uh, shuttle vision plan. And at that time in 2017, um, council directed me to seek VTA funding for shuttle service and to um, look at on-demand service model as a model for the future. Um, in 2020, um, following um, some economic downturn, uh, the Palo Alto shuttle program was um, uh, eliminated, uh, discontinued, um, but also should note that it had experienced year over year declines in ridership um, starting in 2016. So every year, 2016, 2016 through 2020. Um, however, in 2021, one year later, um, we were awarded a $2 million Measure B grant from VTA um, to start this um, on-demand uh, transit service that we had scoped out based on those discussions in 2017. Um, and there we go, I'm changing slides. Um, this next slide, um, actually on the left, what we have is a map that was the quarter mile walk shed um, for transit under the VTA um, next network changes that occurred back in 2017. This was actually a map that I prepared for that discussion um, on our Palo Alto um, uh, shuttle vision. Um, what the walk shed is, is it showed that at that time, including the VTA service and the Palo Alto shuttle service, 61% of Palo Alto residents had access within a quarter mile of walking. And that's what walk shed is. It's how far can you walk reasonable distance to get to transit, um, including the two shuttle routes. Um, I just want to note that the map on the right is the service area of our new service, the on-demand service. So it's going to really cover approximately 100% of our residents. And also noting that there's a, a, a table there that shows the, the uh, ridership details as it decreased year over year for the shuttle service. Um, not to demean the shuttle service, but just noting that um, the services are really different. They're very different types of models. Um, and that um, ultimately we'll have to make a decision at the end of this pilot uh, program about what type of service we want to continue with. And um, with that, I'm just going to dive right into what is this service. Um, so Palto Link is the name of the service and it's on-demand transit. And the easiest way to explain that is to say that it's kind of like a TNC, which is a transportation network company like an Uber or a Lyft, but it's a shared ride. So similar to those services, you would book a ride um, via the web or an app or by calling um, on the phone. We wanted to provide all those options for customers. 
Uh, we're going to have nine vehicles that will serve most of Palo Alto. And our regular fare will be $3.50, but we will have a discounted fare uh, for students, seniors, uh, and low income and disabled, um, which will be $1. And we'll accept cash or mobile pay. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nate Baird, uh, who will take over this presentation. Good evening, council members and mayor. Um, our One of the major ways that we are providing this service is what's to bring on a operator. Um, and our chosen operator is VIA. Um, they've been around since 2017. And in that short few years have become a real leader in on-demand transit services. They have a number of partners, um, not just in California, but across the nation and also internationally. Um, so we're really happy to be partnering with um, a team that has a lot of experience with on-demand transit, um, bringing the assets and the strategy, um, not just with the service itself, but with um, the planning involved and also strategizing about how to chase um, future funds and um, partnerships to keep the service going long-term. Um, their service features um, a branded, uh, City of Palo Alto branded app and um, vehicle as kind of the stars of the service. Um, you will really know that this is a city of Palo Alto transit service um, when you bring when you book these rides and when you see them on the streets. Um, in terms of kind of how we want to be evaluating the service as we kind of um, roll it out over the next 18 months. Um, there's a number of metrics that they are gonna provide to us. Um, we'll have a lot of information about where people are making requests, where people want to go ride, um, the total number of rides that we give, the number of rides per vehicle hours. Um, there's a lot of good information that we'll be getting as this service rolls out in terms of um, what success looks like and what we want success to look like. Um, and we'll also have some opportunity to have some conversations with our community and our constituents as we roll out the program to kind of continue to think about what, what metrics are best to monitor as we roll out. Um, every ride and every driver's ride um, features a ability for a feedback as well. Um, so we'll have direct feedback from both our driver partners and also from our um, customers. Um, marketing and outreach are a really important part of um, what we're rolling out together with FIA. Um, our marketing plan is specifically tailored to our market. Um, we've been in close communications with our um, city managers communications team. Um, and then also we've been um, getting lists together of both destinations, folks we know people want to go to, but also the various service organizations, um, senior services organizations, um, um, places um, that um, house seniors. So we'll have a lot of information. Uh, we'll do a lot of direct marketing. We'll have an insert in the utility bill um, coming out in March to let people know about that as well. So we're really trying to make use of both our assets, um, but also VIA's um, past experience in rolling out these types of services into communities in terms of getting the word out about um, what's, what's um, available. Um, next steps, you know, we're finalizing our marketing and operations details right now, um, figuring out where we're gonna park the vehicles, um, putting together the assets that will go out. Um, the pilot program will begin March 7th, launch March 7th and be in place for 18 months. Um, at the same time, we're also putting together a grant application right now to try to get some additional funding to expand the service. Right now, the service will be from 8 p.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday, um, but we are looking for opportunities to expand that service window because we do know that um, some of the super commuters who come here and some folks that are here have to go other places um, really could use additional evening service or even weekend service. Um, so we're looking at ways to expand that as we can. Um, we'll be providing monthly information. Um, we have a dashboard and all that data available. So we'll be um, just kind of regularly publishing that data. Um, and then we'll have some important meetings and touchstones along the way to, to analyze that and try to figure out what, what, what our information means as we go through it um, with a full evaluation um, about 12 months in um, so that we can start making some decisions about the future for this, for this program. Um, we are happy to answer um, any questions you may have. We also have um, staff via here um, if you have specific questions about VIA's operations. Thank you. Okay, we'll bring it back. Um, well, before we um, take council member questions, I'd like to see if there's any members of the public 
who'd like to make comment on this? Our first public comment speaker will be Aram James. Okay, so I went back to the December 12th consent calendar um, and the 2 million five or approximately amount was put on the consent calendar. I didn't read the entire 43 page contract, but I went through pages seven through nine, probably more exact eight through nine. And guess what? Ed Chicada and members of the staff decided that the drivers could be paid minimum wage. Not prevailing wage, but minimum wage, no benefits. Wonderful. We just dealt with that in terms of our janitors. We all talked about how inhumane that was. We've tried to correct that. Uh, there was a memo by uh, Greer Stone and Pat Burt. Well, um, I don't know how this slipped by, but it's another reason why we need to have people on the council read these contracts. You need to go back to the contract. Like I said, I didn't read all 43 pages. I zeroed in on the wage issue. So now we're going to have people driving in the town who are making minimum wages. Undoubtedly, they're going to have to drive to work in their cars from way out of town. Uh, thank you, uh, Ed Chicada, for thinking about our climate change issue here. Uh, it's just outrageous. Uh, and then these folks are going to have double and triple jobs to try to survive, and they're going to be exhausted while these while they're driving these Ubers. Think about the safety issues there, folks. Do you want to put your kids in an Uber with somebody may, that may be dead tired? It's really outrageous. Uh, Mr. Shikata, uh, you haven't overseen the police the way I want one strike against you. Here you go again. I'll bet you anything you wouldn't work for minimum wages. Uh, you would want comparable pay for your job as a city manager, and I understand that. But why is it that you're so quick uh, to hire uh, outside contractors? And there was a bunch of folks that looked at this. So it wasn't just you, Ed, there was a bunch of other people in transportation, Stanford folks and others, and you all decided it was okay to give 2.5 million to the, uh, this uh, super duper via group but they're going to pay their employees uh, basically slave wages and then drive our precious seniors and, 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 and other citizens around. And, you know, the drivers are going to, they're going to be exhausted because they can't live on minimum wages. You got to go back and correct this. This is really another, uh, like I said, strike against the city manager. Ed, would you live on a minimum wage? Heck no, you wouldn't. So why do you ask other people to do that? And then in a particularly critical job where people are going to be driving around our loved ones. Bad, bad, bad policy. Okay, thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Jonathan Ehrman, followed by Herb Barak. All right. Am I on? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, uh, this is Jonathan Ehrman. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there in person this evening. Uh, I'd, I'd like to be. I just want to, as somebody who uh, has not driven a car in many years, who relies on public transit uh, to get around and have, have to be somewhere later this evening, which is why it wouldn't work to be there because of our public transit. I just want to say how incredibly uh, disappointed and upset I am about this on-demand shuttle system. Uh, if you know if the city wants to try something like this out, they should do. They could do it in addition to uh, the shuttle system. Uh, the 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 city. How do I even start? This before you know. Just we used to have you know a free junior museum and zoo. Now it costs money, and you can't even walk up. We used to have a free shuttle system. Now not only is the on demand system that you're proposing, which is a completely different type of system, so it can't replace what people use the other one for. Not only are you is it a completely different system, but now it costs money as well. So we used to have a free shuttle, but now you have to pay money. And in fact, the full price adult fare is more than a VTA uh, day. You know, uh, one VTA fare. I could ride VTA to San Jose for two. Uh, 250, but in order to go across Palo Alto, apparently a full price adult fare is, is 
350, uh, even though you got a grant from VTA. So we had a free shuttle system. You got a grant from VTA, and yet now it costs money, a completely different system, not the VTA system. So you can't transfer from VTA to this system. You have to pay in individually, and it's only for short rides across Palo Alto. As somebody who relies on transit and who has been hoping that you would bring back uh, to the Crosstown shuttle, uh, I'm incredibly disappointed uh, by this move by both the city, uh, by the tra transportation department in the city and city council in endorsing it. Uh, the buy-in for the grant was the cost of the Crosstown shuttle. So you basically threw the Crosstown shuttle under the bus. And I have to wonder, is there a single person uh, involved in this on the council and planning transportation who relies on public transit or is it all just looking at numbers and well, let's try this, let's try that. I also want to point out that the number of rider the ridership decline figures, just remember, of course, in 2020, obviously, that, you know, that is not a complete year because things were shut down because of COVID. Um, and the city somehow gives us justification that, well, since ridership was declining, we have to try something else. But the city has never has the the uh, the advertising for the for the for the free shuttle service was incredibly poor. Uh, the information on the city website was hard to find. The stops were not clearly defined. Um, you know, when the when the shuttle was when the free shuttle was originally introduced, it ran uh, once every half hour. And then, you know, to save money, it was cut to once every hour. And then some years later, you brought in a consultant to study what you could do to make it uh, to make it better and the consultant suggested well maybe in the middle of the day we could try making it every half an hour uh, because I think there's demand there uh, nobody seemed to be aware of the fact that in fact Richel had originally been a half an hour uh, had been every half an hour when it was first introduced so nobody seems to know what they're doing and nobody is really advocating for people who use public transit uh, I say that the city should first of all I wish they would scrap this and if not they should bring back uh, the free shuttles Mountain View has free shuttles for some reason VTA will pay for shuttles in Mountain View but not in Palo Alto. VTA is desperate to prove that something other than regular bus service works. What I want is the city to invest in bus service. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Herb Barak, followed by Winter Gary. You have... Uh, not yet, Winter. <laughs> uh, uh, Mayor, Mayor Ku, Vice Mayor Stone, and Council members. Um, I have sent you a letter and, and staff has responded uh, to two of the items in my letter. One, that uh, discount does apply to seniors and second, that you can pay cash fare. As Jonathan Ehrman said, uh, you can, an adult for $2.50 can ride a VTA bus all the way down to Eastridge or for $2.25 can take the San Mateo Transit bus to the Daly City BART station. And when BART isn't running, they can take a late night bus, an early morning bus, all the way to downtown San Francisco for $2.25. Uh, what I, as with previous speakers, I had not had an opportunity to see this item when it was previously on your consent calendar, but I think the proper thing to do is to compare uh, the cost of this with uh, a half hour shuttle for Embarcadero and cross town, and also consider uh, the population being served. Essentially, the Crosstown shuttle is serving people who don't have other transportation. That's not uh, what the emphasis has been here. Here it's been on commuters. And so maybe a combination with their driving in from outside Palo Alto and parking somewhere and then taking this shuttle or not. Uh, and also the Crosstown and Embarcadero shuttles went to activity points uh, where people who didn't have cars would want to be going to and had uh, stops where those people lived. And they ran as a scheduled service so people would know when it, it would be there. Here, I think the main motivation is that there's a bunch of money to spend. And, uh, I've had the same concern uh, with, with other issues that before the council that if someone else has a lot of money, you should find someone to give it to and we should use it. But I, I don't see the comparison being made with the prior shuttle. Uh, there was a drop in uh, ridership uh, shown in uh, last budget and the drop in ridership uh, was attributed to the ending of the East Palo Alto shuttle that had come un underneath, you know, that originally was its own and then it came underneath here. So it w wasn't the fact that less people were riding on the cross town and uh, Embarcadero shuttles. As I pointed out in my letter for people, for, for job activities, they're already such as Stanford providing uh, transportation from the Caltrain station uh, to dense, dense job centers, uh, individual companies provide their own transportation of, of this sort. 
And I guess in a sense, it's what, similar to what's going on in the senior center. It's no more a senior, something called a senior center for seniors. Instead, there's a place which uh, caters to people 50 years old and the businesses that want to sell them goods and services. And here, maybe part of the motivation here is to not serve the people who used to be served by the shuttle system. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And our last speaker is Winter Gary. Actually, it's Winter Dellenbuck. Um, so I just want to say I am completely stoked about this. I am excited. It's finally the shuttle program that I want that is useful and easy for myself, my husband. We share one car by choice. We have for years. It usually works out because we have, we're both madly busy. But every now and we usually, but we're flexible usually and we can accommodate, but sometimes we get hung up and we can't. And it's a problem with the car. And this is a fix and it's low cost. And the difference between this and the fricking bus is you can get this, you can get this service easily and then it takes you right where you want to go. And this is fantastic. And the bus doesn't do that. And um, I, I just want to thank the city for this. I want to thank for pursuing the funding for this. I want to thank the transportation folks for this. And I really hope it works out. And I hope it works out so well. We can expand it. We can expand it into the evening hours. Um, I am enthusiastic about this. And I think a lot of people, uh, my clock is at the timing. Can people hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Because the clock's not, uh, nothing's happening with the clock. Um, anyway, uh, all right. So uh, I've said what I want to say. This is good price, um, like the flexibility with seniors and, and, and 350 at the most is a deal. It is such a deal. I think about Uber and Lyft, Ugh, who needs it? And uh, um, the uh, get to where you want to go, uh, not hard to catch. I'm looking forward to the app and there are alternatives to the app. You can make a phone call. So um, uh, people with different uh, uh, abilities with uh, things can uh, use this. Good job. Love it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. That's our last request to speak. Thank you. Uh, we'll bring it back to council. If there's any uh, questions, comments, Please um, hit your lights. Uh, Council Member Stone, oh, Vice Mayor Stone. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, first, just want to thank, thank staff for really the proactive work in pursuing this grant and finding a provider for the, for the service. Really love to see just the out of the box thinking, especially to solve, which is probably one of the more vexing problems in city planning and transportation, which is that last mile issue. And I thought that graphic you showed at the beginning of the slideshow really showing the, the reach of this service is, is really going to help a lot of people. So I'm very enthusiastic and excited for this. I want to thank you for that. Uh, just a few questions. So the fleet's going to have two reserve vans. Are those vans intended to be used when rider capacity is maximized or is that just for when an active van uh, just becomes out of order? Uh, so I, I might need to call up our, our partner from VIA to, to speak to that. I believe it's one reserve vehicle. Is that correct? Um, staff report said two. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it, it's it's intended to be flexible, I believe, but it's, it's really so if one of the vehicle needs to be repaired or something like that, um, I believe unless, um, Garrett, would you like to add any context to that? Yeah, hello, Council. Um, so that is essentially right, uh, but spares can be flexed as need be. We try to, uh, at least with this size of, um, of fleet, try to keep one uh, on reserve in case there are some issues with the, with the active vehicles, um, but, but those can be used for, for active purposes as well. Great, so morning commutes, afternoon commutes, it's possible to be able to bring more on board. Correct. Okay, perfect, thank you. And appreciated the discounted price for seniors and low income and, and youth. 
Uh, love to see us be able to add veterans to that to that list as as well. I assume that's a possibility. Yes. Well, noting that many veterans would fit within one of those other categories, um, but currently the funding um, that we have set aside, um, when we applied for the funding, we have set grant criteria um, for how we're going to set the fares. So I'm not sure if that's something that we can adjust it for the pilot. That is something that we could make sure is incorporated into the future um, service, but we'll look into that. Yeah. Um, I'd, yeah. I'd appreciate if you looked into it because I'd imagine it might be a possibility. So it'd be wonderful. The door-to-door -door service only it says only for riders who need it. Who determines that need? The rider is going to determine that need. Oh, okay. So that's that's going to be something the rider can request if they really want that door-to-door -door service. Just knowing that every time you get on the service, it's less efficient if it needs to go to every house door-to-door. -door. So if you're capable um, to to not take it right from your door, that's how we'd like you to request the ride. Um, but understanding that you know somebody. Um, might have a disability or something that they don't want to um, um, walk or they or they or they're maybe their parents um, putting them on a ride and they don't want them leaving the house or something. So there's going to be reasons why somebody might want to request that door to door um, higher level of service. Thank you. And is the only way to be picked up through calling in or through the web? I mean, if uh, if somebody is walking down the street, they see one of these shuttles passing by, can they flag it down or? No, it's, this is uh, by request only, uh, by reservation only. One, okay, thank you. And then last question. So over the course of the first 15 months, all funding's coming from Measure B and from Ride Fair, correct? None from the city until that pilot program ends and if we choose to move forward? Yeah, thank, thank you for that clarification. Um, currently, the way all the funding is coming from VTA and or our um, in-kind match, and the funding from um, fair revenue. The in-kind match is, is Nate's staff time uh, working on the program. So we're using staff time working on the program and the fares to cover the city's local match. Thanks um, for that. One, one thing just to add to that is we're trying to seek additional funding partners. So we're trying to work with Stanford Research Park um, to see if they wanna expand service in their area. Um, and we believe that we're gonna be able to potentially bring in more funding um, to expand the service. Great, perfect, thanks so much. Councilmember Lowing. I also want to thank you for kind of thinking out of the box, as the vice mayor said, and <clears throat> working on this. And I won't repeat the good questions that he already asked, but um, so this is this is app or phone call, right, to, to get it. So that means it's inclusive of seniors and disabled and all that, which is great. Um, <clears throat> and the hours aren't on the slides. What are the hours? The hours are 8 a.m. till 6 p.m. currently. On seven days a week? No, Monday through Friday. Okay, I, I, I just missed that. Um, and the part, your target partners, you just mentioned people like uh, a Stanford Research Park. Is that the kind of sort of best target partner? Uh, well, I think that's a really good one. Um, noting that they, they similarly had discontinued some of their shuttle service um, just before the pandemic or during the pandemic. So they potentially have um, a need um, to um, expand um, their opportunities to get to and from there. And it, it's mutually beneficial. So that that is, but ideally we get many different partners or more than one different partner to help make this service um, be something that extends beyond the pilot. Right. Assuming so for, we're happy for, with the pilot after- For future we funding. Yep, Keep that's this right. thing going. Okay. Um, and then just in general, are you looking at other shuttle opportunities as well? Are there other things on your whiteboard or your drawing board that you're also considering? Because this is a pilot, it may work, it may not, but even if it's gloriously successful, maybe there's something else we need too. Yeah, well- Not to be uh, greedy because we have nothing no, now, so well, I'm happy, but- uh, No, yeah, thank you. Well, just noting that actually we had talked about expanding the um, Palo Alto shuttle, the prior service. Um, that was what we talked about at the, the shuttle, um, within the shuttle vision plan. Yeah. Um, so that is a potential opportunity that we could look at if you know we evaluate this and we don't find it meets um, the needs of Palo Alto. Um, there are other options, noting that funding availability, outside funding availability is really limited. Like this funding would not have been available for our old shuttle service. It was only available for this type of new innovative, it's actually in the funding category, innovative transit. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Councilmember Burt. 
Thank you. And um, my apology if any of my questions that were addressed earlier uh, before I arrived. Um, what types of vehicles are we going to be using as far as emission types? We're going to um, initially we're going to have three EV vehicles and six hybrid vehicles. Um, although noting that one of the goals in our um, contract is for them to strive to um, switch to um, full EV fleet. Um, although that might or might not be possible, that is one of the things we're seeking um, additional grant funding for is to transition the fleet fully to EV. When you say it might or might not be possible, what would make it impossible? Funding, funding constraints. Um, and are you saying that within the budget that of the grant that we've been allotted, they would be limited in their funding? Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So our current funding, the way that it's set up, we have it scoped for three electric vehicles and six hybrid vehicles. And um, the grantors, uh, was there any element to the kind of sustainability of this program from the standpoint of vehicle emissions? You're really drawing on my memory, but yes, I, I believe there was, and, and that was one of the things that we said that we would strive for is, is um, vehicles that lessen the um, impact of environment. Well, rather than um, try and dig into that tonight, is that something that can be provided uh, subsequent to the meeting? So we really understand that. So we're going into a vehicle, a new program, and uh, the future of not only individual uh, car ownership, but also transit is toward um, uh, lower and lower emission vehicles. Um, I'll say that VTA is only starting to ramp up on their uh, electric buses and looking at other um, technologies uh, going forward. So it's not like this program is behind what they're doing, but it's a concern that a number of us on the VTA board have had and seeing that this program locally it's going to have some positive elements, but I would say not adequate. And so I guess I'd, I'd like to see when you say that uh, in the future, this may happen. I'd, I'd like to see some reporting back as part of the report back system that we're, we're talking about on evaluating this specifically to look at where are we on transitioning to zero emission vehicles? What's it gonna take? And if that's maybe even city funding, I mean, we, um, whether it's for this or considering the traditional shuttle, uh, Measure K was one third of that was for transportation funding. And we stated in that uh, discussion on it that the bulk of that was local share for grade separations, but included in consideration was local transit restoration. Um, so I, I think that within that one third of the Measure K dollars, there are dollars to either expand traditional or bring back a traditional shuttle prospectively or to strengthen this and make it more sustainable. Um, and I, I guess one thing that I brought up when uh, you brought this forward initially or, or that we had some discussion was I asked about uh, the kind of the risk that this will become a door-to-door uh, -door service for high school students or middle, even middle school students who instead would be riding their bikes. And our whole initiative is to have safe routes to school and, and promote bike riding. And if I recall correctly, you had said that, well, part of this is that student revenue from students is built in as part of our needed revenue model. And, I, and that made me think, okay, I understand that and why it would help drive revenue and utilization, but that, response seem to be focusing just on that beneficial aspect, which is driving revenue versus a detrimental aspect, which is moving kids who are maybe fairly affluent to essentially having a cheap ride share every day to school. Um, now, if it's uh, an occasion where there's an unusual circumstance, then some of those kids might need that. But that's a concern I have as well. And so when that reporting back comes, uh, I'd like to uh, request that we see what is going on in terms of student utilization, how much is middle school, how much is high school, and, um, and we loop back with the Safe Routes to School program on 
how this initiative meshes with our commitments there. Uh, thank you. I just I, I know there wasn't exactly a question there, but I just want to note that one of the things we will be collecting is a lot of data about where trips are happening to and from and potentially school district could be a partner, one of the partners that, you know, we talk about in the future if we see really high utilization. Um, another thing, just want to note that um, at least six of our vehicles will have bike racks. Um, so just want to note that. And lastly, I think for students, um, a lot of them have figured out how to get to school without the shuttle service and with, you know, taking other means. I don't know how many of them are going to take um, um, this new um, service. I think there will be some, but what we're hoping is it's the ones that really need this type of trip. The ones that have a really far commute and haven't had, you know, are taking maybe getting a ride in a, a single occupancy vehicle from their parents or something like that. So well, I'll say neither of us know, none of us know how many students there will be. I probably have greater concern than you do in terms of that it could be a temptation um, to uh, to have that free ride share or that low cost ride share to school every day uh, and shift people back from a bike mode to uh, this kind of ride share. I don't know, uh, but I, I certainly want to keep an eye on it. Thank you. Council member Lithcott Haynes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I wanna thank staff as well for their excellent presentation and the public and my colleagues for their comments. I know we're all excited to be bringing a city shuttle back and it's great to have some measure be funding for 18 months so that we can study usage and see what makes the most sense. It's great that some are fully electric and as council member Bird has said, we wanna see all of the fleet get there. My question center on when is the service provided, equity across the city, cost, and ultimately what our goals are in putting this shuttle together. Regarding when, I am concerned that the service is, as it stands, only Monday through Friday, not weekends, and 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. The staff report says that passes catering to commuters will be provided, which sounds wonderful. But if so, it seems we would want a 7 a.m. start time, as many people do need to be at work at 8, if not earlier. It says it was designed to support first mile, last mile for those who take public transit, such as Caltrain, and has been designed to coincide with Caltrain peak hours, but their peak hours are 6 to 9 a.m. and 4 to 7 p.m. So I'm not sure that our stated hours fully align with those particular goals. Um, on the map that was shown of the coverage of the city, at one point there was a map that had the little icon for each shuttle. And I wondered if they were just scattered randomly on the map or if they were gonna, if each shuttle was gonna be sort of housed in those nine areas that were placed on the map, just random. So go ahead. Yeah, those were just random locations random. on the map. Sorry. Okay, no worries. As someone who lives on the south side, I couldn't help but notice that six of them are on or north of uh, Page Mill or Oregon, and three of them to the south. And that's just something I'm always going to pay attention to. That's just, you know, so, but thank you. I'm glad to know that that was random. Um, I note that this is potentially a great service for seniors. And my own mother, who's a senior, has decided to come to our city council meeting today to see her daughter in action and make sure I'm doing a good job. So um, I have her very much in mind when I evaluate many things. And um, I wonder what the staffing customer support plan is for seniors who may want to use the shuttle, have the app, app doesn't seem to be working, they have their phone, they call somebody, who is actually providing the staffing and how responsive do you expect that to be able to be? Um, thank you. So um, I would have to turn that over to Garrett um, from VIA, but um, I, I suspect that most people will not be booking their trips um, by telephone. Um, however, so, so that said, I suspect that the telephone line will not be overly inundated with calls. I think the people that really need to make the calls um, will be able to reach someone. Um, but I'd like to call Garrett up to speak to that. Mm -hmm. So we, we do have dedicated uh, call support for, for folks that are calling in for the service. Um, the response time is usually between about one to three minutes. Um, and for those that we have folks who are, you know, specifically trained to work with, with seniors and, and, and um, many of our services, actually, there, there are specifically senior focused services um, that are similar to this in, in places all across the country. Um, and so the folks that will be calling in, uh, our folks will be particularly mindful uh, and, and be able to assist them in that way. Okay, thank you. I agree with the members of the public who have raised concerns about why we're moving from a free shuttle to a paid model and share the concerns that we seem to be becoming a pay to play city, uh, the Junior Museum and Zoo, for example. 
when I do the math, it seems we have priced this by assuming riders will be responsible for the 500K that is not covered by the grant. We've estimated 550 riders a day on weekdays, so we've arrived at a cost of $3.50 to cover the 500 grand. We're asking residents to pick up fully 20% of the cost. To the point of a few commenters, why is the cost of our shuttle so much higher than a bus to Daly City or San Jose? And how many of us are on the council and in staff are actually adding up these dollars and figuring out if we can make 350 each way work at $7 round trip, that's almost the cost of crossing the Golden Gate Bridge. Which for me gets to the bigger question, which is why are we doing this? What is our aim? If we truly want to incentivize people to use green technology and public transportation, shouldn't we price it to make this option incredibly attractive? So I'd like to ask, is there an articulated goal at this point of being able to one day reduce this rate if say ridership exceeds our expectations? And concomitantly, is there a plan to promote the shuttle to such an extent that we can really push usage and bring the per person per rider cost down? Thank you. Uh, thank you. And um, uh, well, I'll speak to that really quickly. And then I wanted to circle back to one of the public comments if I can. Um, just wanted to note that the fares schedule was set up not um, with the intention of fully um, recouping the exactly the five hundred thousand dollars. We really don't know exactly what ridership is going to be like. I mean, that's really what this is going to be is a pilot where we're going to evaluate. Um, so, as I mentioned, some of the 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 of some of our local match is going to come from Nate's um, staff time. Um, but the fares were set up through the grant application process. There was um, minimum recommended fares um, that were set by VTA in this process. That is uh, the, the fares in general is something that we can really evaluate um, as we get through the pilot and find out and was, as we're getting feedback from customers about what it is. Um, but also noting that this really does reflect a higher level service. These are service, these are trips where somebody can take a trip from their house to a location that maybe was not previously served by any other transit service. We've heard, you know, we, we went over and we were talking with La Comida, um, I'm sorry, with um, Avenidas, and they were telling us, we have somebody who needs to get to a, this vision appointment, and there's no way they could get there in public transit before. They used to put them on an actual lift each way. So you can imagine how much that costs. This is now a dollar trip for them each direction. So it's very different. It's hard to compare to just a traditional transit service, but it does typically reflect a higher cost. Um, sorry, the public comment I wanted to mention um, was regarding the minimum wage. I just wanted to note that the minimum wage is just our standard contract language requiring at least the minimum wage be met um, rules in our city. Um, but I, we can call up uh, Garrett to talk to this, but noting that they're gonna do a uh, competitive market analysis to determine what their wages will be in Palo Alto um, because of course they have to be able to actually hire operators. Um, they have to be able to pay them in order to hire them. I know that wasn't directly your question, but I just wanted to make sure that got covered. Uh, I want to thank all the council members for their question because most of mine have been answered. Um, although I did want to um, find out, VIA is also the service that, um, are they the same service that uh, is used for uh, by VTA for the senior um, drive around? No. No, uh, I, if you're referring to the paratransit service, uh, no, it's not. It's um, not. Um, but however, VIA does operate in Cupertino, um, I believe West Sacramento. West Sacramento, is it Sacramento. Richmond? Sacramento. Yeah, I'm okay. making him shout across the room here. Okay. Um, they also operate LA Metro. Those are the ones I know offhand. Thank you, yeah, um, I, that was gonna be my next question is what cities are they operating in? Because, um, you know, with our permit system, the parking permit system, there always seems to be some glitch when they're trying to purchase uh, their parking uh, permits. And so with this um, uh, shuttle system or um, drive around system, I, I think it's important to, for people to know that it operates very well and with your turnaround time. Um, um, uh, I thought someone was saying something here. And where are the vehicles parked when they're not in use? We're, we're trying to negotiate that, but likely um, at this point, we're gonna have them park in one of our parking garages um, in the off hours, which would be 6 p.m. until 8 a.m. Um, noting that we also do need to have them charging somewhere. Um, so we're trying to figure out which exact garage um, they'll be parking in, but one of the city garages. 
Okay. And I just want to say um, that there are many people that actually do not go online or use apps in order to, so I do see potentially a high number of people using the phone to call. But also um, I think that when you're doing marketing, there needs to be marketing in uh, perhaps even Chinese, because I know that there was a lot of them that were using the Crosstown shuttle to get to La Camita or to other places. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a great point. Um, noting that when I needed to do a shuttle survey previously, I needed to do the survey in Spanish, English, and um, Chinese in order to capture um, the, the actual uh, thoughts of the writers. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, it, oh, and then I also attended a um, PAUSD school meeting at one time, and there were people that came up to speak and say, and they said that they needed busing services. Um, so um, I think that that might be an opportunity for the city schools liaison committee to bring that up and to see, you know, how they might be uh, willing to look into it. Because um, I think um, it's mostly all the postdoc uh, families that is requiring that and they're having difficulty getting their kids to school um, in a short time frame. Um, okay, I think that's about it, but thank you very much for the presentation. Oh, I'm sorry, I have one. Council member Tanaka. Yeah, thank you for uh, bringing this to us. Appreciate your work on it. A few questions. So um, when would this program start? Um, the program is started to, uh, slated to start on March 7th. Okay. And um, how was uh, the current provider selected versus, let's say, Uber or Lyft? Um, because I, I remember when I traveled to Las Vegas, they had a, the city had a program where they would provide a free trip one way to downtown because they wanted to encourage more people to shop. And it was actually really convenient. And it was very flexible for the city because they just basically, they geocoded it. And so it was basically free. Um, uh, with that, you know, anywhere from that area to downtown. But so, I, so this, these kind of services exist, and I was wondering why didn't we pick a more popular provider? Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure I heard that last little bit. But so, just to note, we went through a competitive bid process. We had a request for proposals, and we received bids, and then we evaluated the bids, and then um, a council um, awarded the contract. I see. Okay. Um, and then where are we at on the, well, I guess, do we actually approach uh, Uber or Lyft on this as well? Uh, I would need to confirm that with the contract staff. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have that information. Okay. It's just because hand, it's, but... it's because there's a lot of drivers and it'd be very easy for them to do this. Um, okay. And then um, um, my other question is, uh, whatever happened to our scooter share program? Because we approved this like three years ago now, and it's been a long time, and this would actually cut down a lot of trips, right? Especially from the Caltrain station. Uh, yeah, so just uh, regarding that, I, I, I hate to, I'm, I think this is a little bit of a different subject, but the scooter share um, and bike share program um, was put on hold during the pandemic, as we noted that other um, jurisdictions and the scooter share vendors were changing their models and started um, charging cities and having a little bit more burden placed on cities. And so we were re really re-evaluating re how we can actually roll that out. We believe that we need staff resources in order to actually roll this um, the scooter and bike share out. And so that's something we'll be seeking in the future. Okay, I'd like to see this happen sooner than later, especially since we already voted on it. And then um, in terms of the cost, I, I, I have to agree with a lot of the members of the public in terms of the cost. Um, I would like to actually love to see this service free for everyone. Um, and, uh, and we could justify this as needed, but really to get adoption going and it'll give you a lot of publicity as well if it was low cost or free. And, um, and you know, I realize that there's some economic issues here as well. So if not free for everyone, at least for students, because we don't really have a bus system in our city. And so if you could do that, I think that'd be really, really good. And then uh, my other question for you is response time. So, so if someone requests this, is it like, like Uber, you, you do Uber or Lyft, you request, you get a car in like five minutes or less. What kind of response time are we looking at here? Um, 
so I, I just want to actually quickly address a different uh, question or point that you had, which just to, I want to quickly note that the first month, our service will be free. Oh, good, um, good. So I just want to note that um, that's one of the promotions. We'll actually be having okay. uh, multiple promotions throughout the year um, that we'll be running. Um, regarding response time, I'm wondering, Garrett, can you speak to that? But just noting that some of it's going to have to do with our demand, which we don't sure. fully understand yet. And that's really part of what we're going to evaluate in the pilot. It might be that we have too many vehicles. It might be that we need more vehicles. And so that's going to be something that we're going to really have to understand, or even more likely we need more vehicles at a certain time and we need less vehicles at another time. But I think Philip captured it quite well. Um, it's a delicate balance between supply and demand, uh, but we're constantly working on almost a daily basis with city staff um, using some pretty sophisticated internal simulation and service design tools um, to model out the, the service and sort of determine what is the ideal wait time based on demand and, and supply. Um, so you could think about it as uh, you know more in, in terms of a better headway than probably most uh, fixed route buses um, and probably a few more minutes than say a private ride share uh, like, like an Uber or Lyft. And so it's meant to provide a really good quality of service um, and, and sufficient wait times um, I don't want to put anything to it to a, a number per se, but uh, you could think of most of our services having somewhere between about a, a 10 or so minute um, wait time. But again, entirely dependent on, on supply and demand. And that can evolve over time as, as well. The, the algorithm gets smarter, gets more efficient, determines um, where pickup and drop offs are happening. And that, that can actually improve wait times um, and, and the quality of service okay. over time as well. Yep. Thank you. Yep. And, and if I can, just one more thing. That's going to be one of the criteria that we look at to evaluate the service. Okay. So, I mean, this is another reason why I think we should have just piggybacked on one of the existing rideshare networks versus the smaller one, because it makes it really hard to predict. You can't provide the level of service that people kind of expect these days. Um, but okay, anyways, put water in the bridge. Um, and so my last comment here, because I'm over time here, is... Um, is I, I, I agree with uh, my fellow council member in terms of more hours, right? I, I do wonder about the hours. It seems awful restrictive. It doesn't seem like it's well for students or well for people that are working. Um, so I, I think the hours need to be expanded. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I did want to ask, um, remind us what happened, the difficulties we were having with the um, free shuttle that we had in town. So there were two different services that was providing it. And I think at a certain point, it started, the drivers was difficult to procure. Was that so? Yeah, well, there, and just to note, we had two different shuttle routes. Um, actually, we initially had three different shuttle routes back pre-2016, I guess. But um, 2016 on, we had two different shuttle routes. One of those shuttle routes was actually operated by Caltrain. Um, and... Um, with that, regarding that service route, that one, they really had a hard time keeping operators. That one, we had a lot of days where we had the service gaps um, because Caltrain was having, and just in general, the industry was having a hard time retaining operators. Um, so that one was having challenges. Also, at the same time, Caltrain was um, uh, charging more and more money each year to operate that shuttle. So the costs were going up, the ridership was going down. Um, similarly with a cross town shuttle, although we weren't having as many operator issues, we had, um, fairly steady operators costs were continuing to climb and the ridership was continuing to decline. And, um, Mr. Garrett, you would be, your drivers are pretty secure <laughs> in terms of ensuring that these rides will continue on and that we will have the drivers in place. Yes, uh, that's correct. So I, I'll say, um, of the, uh, we've, 600 partnerships all over the world, 50 just here in, in the state of California, um, and about a, a dozen plus uh, just, just here in the Bay Area. So we first off have um, a, a very strong pool of, of drivers um, that we're, we're already pulling from um, here in the Bay Area. Um, also have, despite a lot of the, um, the driver shortages with more tradi with traditional public transit services um, throughout the entire about three years where, or so where we've been dealing, especially with driver shortages in, in the transit industry, uh, VIA has never had a challenge in, in launching or maintaining a service over time. And so have really developed um, a pretty strong muscle in being able to, to recruit and train drivers as well. Thank you. That's very reassuring. Um, Council Member Lithcott Hames. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Just one additional thought. Um, as I've tried to pay attention to what makes public transportation attractive uh, to people versus not, 
I'm sort of struck by the fact that you can move from you ought to take it, you have to take it to you want to take it by being a little bit more playful with it. So I love that you're already, you've already got it branded with Palo Alto colors and kind of the Palo Alto marketing way. It already looks like us. I would encourage us to think about going a step farther, perhaps even a little contest for elementary school kids to suggest to name the vans. If we have nine, we're going to pick nine names. And so it's not just the van that's coming. It's like, it has a funny, I'm not going to even come up with an example, but you'd see what I'm saying. And it's a little bit more playful. And it's like, oh, which one were you in? Oh, I was in this one. Oh, I was in this one. It just might help boost readership. Thank you. Ridership. Thank you. I think um, I don't see any more lights. And so I want to thank staff for bringing this to us. And we'll move on to um, ad agenda changes, additions, and deletions. Um, Sure. Uh, go ahead. Um, I did want to note, uh, uh, thank you, Mayor, that uh, for the council's awareness that we understand that getting through your agenda this evening may be challenging. And uh, so as such, wanted to just uh, provide a little bit of context uh, for your consideration on your action items. We've got uh, number seven, which is the leaf floor enforcement, number eight, our long range uh, fis uh, financial forecast and AA1, which is a follow up to your uh, priorities uh, setting and uh, setting of objectives. Um, again, just, just a little bit of background of as you get into your discussion, one on the uh, leaf floor enforcement, would expect we'll have some uh, community members speaking uh, to that item. If your discussion uh, suggests that more uh, extensive discussion is needed, you could refer that to a committee. Logically, the policy and services committee. Don't have any uh, expect expectation that that would be the case, but just wanted to uh, bring that option to your attention. Number eight uh, on the long range financial forecast is not, is somewhat time sensitive, but not critically time sensitive. So uh, that uh, should it uh, be uh, unable to be heard this evening could be heard next week. And then AA1, uh, since uh, we have uh, heard that there's some interest in that discussion would suggest that you switch the order uh, so that it would be seven, AA1, and then eight. A long, long explanation, my apologies, uh, but did think that might be helpful for your consideration. Thank you. I was going to suggest that it seems like it is a pretty packed agenda, so I would propose to the council members um, to hear action item AA1 before action number eight, and then we'll do a check-in at 10 to see if we can, we either uh, move forward with action eight, which is the long range financial plan or, um, or defer it to another day. Um, so I just want to see if council members are okay with moving up AA1. Uh, council member Burt. Uh, yes, I, I am uh, supportive of moving it forward. And, um, but I, I think it's a real understatement to say that it's a challenging agenda. I think it's an agenda that is uh, not um, well considered to uh, start an item at schedule at 1030 at night, which could be a couple hour discussion. And uh, we've really got to get to a point where we're having these agendas in, in a more realistic way. I do think that actually, so it, it may rather than even say we're going to consider getting the eight, I'm not sure that we're going to uh, be able to complete the priority setting item. I mean, it's gonna be an extensive, important discussion. that's really guiding our year. So um, I think we ought to just um, move eight to uh, next week. And it, when I saw it on the agenda originally, I was struggling to go through comparing the long range financial forecast and I didn't yet have the mid-year budget updates, which have more contemporary information, as well as focusing on the mid-year. And it just seems logical that we would do the two of those together in the same meeting so that we can match them. So I, I think um, just we ought to go ahead and say we're going to do eight next week. Is that okay if, with all the council members? If so. I might uh, just make one point, I forgot to mention earlier, uh, Mayor, uh, is that number eight, uh, your long range financial forecast actually was recommended unanimously by the uh, finance committee. Again, this was uh, last year's finance committee, but again, recognizing that uh, we've had transition on the council uh, was brought forward to you as an action item. So again, just for your um, uh, awareness. 
I appreciate that. So we will um, defer number eight, the long range financial plan to um, next week. Excuse me, sorry, um, Madam Mayor, just point of procedure. So if we are going to make changes to tonight's agenda, those do need to be by motion and approved by the majority of the council. So everything you sort of uh, uh, suggested is, is doable, but procedurally that's, that's how uh, the council needs to proceed. Okay, in that case then, uh, go ahead, Council um, Member. I will move that we uh, postpone item eight to the February 13th meeting. I'll second that. Oh, <laughs> city manager. And, and for your consideration, if we proceed with that, we would also recommend pulling or deferring the committee work plans, which are currently scheduled on your February 14th, the 13th, sorry, uh, agenda uh, in order to provide sufficient time next week. And that would be the standing committees. Correct, yes. Okay, so can we um, go for the vote, please, um, Madam Clerk? Councilmember Lithcott Hames? Yes. Councilmember Vinker? Yes. Councilmember Tanaka? Councilmember Burt? Yes. Councilmember Lowing? Yes. Vice Mayor Stone? Yes. Mayor Ku? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Um, I also would like to see if um, council members would be okay with moving council comments, questions, and announcements to the to after the city manager comments. Should I take a vote on does that need to go into motion, Mr. Arellano? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor. And then just one other question about the action items. So uh, the order would then be item seven discussion regarding gas power leaf blower enforcement and then item AA1 when we get to the action por portion. Correct. Okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, the answer to your first question is, is yes, regarding um, council member questions, comments, and announcements. Okay. Then I would like to move um, council member questions, comments, and announcements to after the city manager comments. Second. Thank you, council member Vinker. For clarification, Mayor, could I ask if this is um, a one off for tonight only, or do you anticipate doing this every week? It's a one-off for tonight. Okay, thank you. Um, can you call the votes? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Tanaka. Yeah, um, I thought at our, pol our, at our policy manual meeting, we actually already talked about redoing the agenda. So um, wouldn't, wouldn't that just follow uh, what we talked about and voted on? I think it was unanimous uh, at the meeting. This is not the way to do it. Um, so if city manager, you could. Um... Right. Um, so based upon the discussion you had, was it last Monday? Last Monday. The, um, yeah, time flies. The uh, staff is uh, redrafting the procedures uh, portion of your handbook, and we'll bring that back uh, shortly within the next uh, few weeks. And so I think uh, we've concluded that uh, given the number of changes, it would be best to bring that back to you on consent and that the changes will be effective uh, at, that, um, at that point. Thank you for the explanation. Um, Madam Clerk, will you please um, take the vote? Council Member Burt? Yes. Vice Mayor Stone? Yes. Yeah. Council Member Lifcott Hames? Yes. <laughs> Mayor Koo? Yes. Councilmember Tanaka? Yes. Councilmember Lowing? Yes. Councilmember Vinker? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Um, we will go to public comments on items not on the agenda now. Madam Clerk. Our first speaker will be Andy, Andrea Gara speaking in chambers for a group on behalf of Katie Ruff, Hillary Glan, Alex Campos, Susan Chamberlain, and Kat Snyder uh, for 10 minutes and followed by Maureen Bard. Uh, my name is Andrea Guerra. I'm speaking as a co-chair of 350 Palo Alto, but also on behalf of a coalition of local groups including leader, leading environmental organizations, 
passionate student groups, worship groups, physicians, and parents. All of us are urging the Palo Alto City Council to adopt a date for ending the flow of natural gas. Um, is my slides uh, show up at the moment? Okay, I'll give that one minute. Meanwhile, I do have a number of supporters here tonight. I'm gonna to ask them to briefly stand and identify themselves. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. The organizations that have signed on to our request uh, are Benny Soul Solar, Carbon Free Palo Alto, Climate Action California, First Presbyterian Palo Alto Cool Planet Group, Fossil Free Building Silicon Valley, Gun High School Green Team, Menlo Spark, Mothers Out Front Silicon Valley, Palo Alto Student Climate Coalition, Project Green Home, San Francisco Bay Physicians for Social Responsibility, Sunrise Silicon Valley, Unitarian Universalist Church of Palo Alto Green Sanctuary Committee, 350 Bay Area, 350 Silicon Valley, and 350 Palo Alto. Next slide, please. Last year, as you know, Palo Alto formally adopted their 80 by 30 plan. That is our plan to reduce greenhouse gases 80% by the year 2030. We've also named climate, uh, climate a top priority again for the year 2023. Now it's time to make our ambitious climate uh, pledges a reality. When we were formulating 80 by 30, Palo Alto asked the staff for a plan to make that happen. Next slide, please. These were the staff findings. 35% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from natural gas. <clears throat> that makes it second only to transportation for emissions. To reach our 80 by 30 goal, staff found we need to electrify nearly all single family households plus commercial HVAC systems. And I just wanna point out that this was not one path they found to 80 by 30, it was the only path to 80 by 30. Next slide, please. Why is natural gas a problem? Uh, it is largely methane, which is a greenhouse gas that, gas that has 80 times the potency of CO2 during its first two decades in the atmosphere. It's responsible for about 30% of the warming we've seen on the planet so far. Um, this powerful greenhouse gas also has a short half-life and that makes it an opportunity for fast climate action. Next slide, please. We're not asking council for a specific shutoff date, but we think it's important to review what the scientists are telling us. Last year, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change told us that by the year 2030, our emissions trajectory will be cast, determining the, this century's climate outcome. That panel also found that mitigation efforts that happened after 2030 are unlikely to prevent us from exceeding the critical 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature rise. And just as a reminder, that's the temperature at which we have an increased risk of tipping points that can cause cascading and irreversible planetary damage. Next slide, please. So what does our greenhouse gas trajectory look like right now? Uh, not great. The latest figures we have are for 2021. They showed the largest methane increase ever recorded, plus the highest ever annual level of CO2. We have a very long way to go in a short window. Next window, next slide. <laughs> uh, we have a massive public awareness problem here in Palo Alto. We know that our residents want climate action. They have consistently re-elected members who crafted our climate goals, and they recently elected new outspoken advocates for climate. They are switching to EVs in record numbers. However, when we go out in the community and we talk to people, there is very little awareness that their um, home gas appliances have an impact on the climate. Next slide, please. A sunset date will fast track public awareness about the climate and health impacts of methane. It will also set a clear timeline so that residents and utilities can plan ahead. We need to educate residents. We need to ease, ease the path 
And importantly, we have to create conditions that will make our target an inevitability. We know that voluntary electrification will not get us to 80 by 30. Technology adoption curves consistently show that 20 to 25% of people will be very late and or resistant to making a switch. And that is a luxury of time that we don't have. Next slide, please. We'd like to, to ask the council to engage in some moonshot thinking. We know where we need to go, but we don't know exactly how we're going to get there yet. However, Silicon Valley is a national center of innovation. We need to tap into the extraordinary talent in our community, in our area universities, and in our own city staff to develop a technical and financial roadmap to our sunset date. We're asking council to direct staff to begin that process this year. Next slide, please. Yes, there are roadblocks to electrification, but they are not insurmountable. We need to remove the financial burden, but we have an excellent model in our new heat pump water heater program that offers fast permitting, discounts, plus no interest financing. We need to continue to work with the state to ensure that we have the electrification workforce we need. And I wanna thank the council members who have already begun that process. We need to make sure our grid is ready. Residential upgrades are projected to be finished by 2030, but we have to make sure that we adequately fund this effort. In the meantime, we need to press ahead. We know that the grid is ready now for citywide water heater conversions, and some neighborhoods are ready for full electrification. Finally, we have to ease resident worries about blackouts. That means promoting home solar and educating residents about bi-directional EV chargers or battery backup systems for their homes. Next slide. Right now, we have a unique window of opportunity with the Federal Inflation Reduction Act. This includes billions of dollars to support electrification. Incentives are, are available for electric appliances plus upgrading wiring, and they're good through 2031. We're also well aligned with what's happening at the state level. The CA Air Resource Board proposal that was uh, the, the recent proposal would end the sale of gas powered furnaces and water heaters starting in the year 2030. The Bay Area Air Quality Management District is considering a zero emission standard that could put our region on an even faster timeline. Next slide, please. Finally, I would like to emphasize that asking for a sunset date is not about taking away the gas. It's about transitioning to the sustainable energy source of the future. Just as EVs are the future of cars, electric homes are the future. We want the transition to be well-planned and equitable. Mankind has transitioned many times before. We used to heat and cook with wood fire and coal. These transitions have always been step forwards and, and electrified homes are the next step forward. We all want a future with clean, healthy, abundant energy and efficient appliances. We believe that presented with the facts and a robust plan, the community will ultimately accept a sunset date and support it. In addition to all of the signatories, 350 stands ready to provide all of the public education assistance that we can. Finally, this council, which has shown an extraordinary dedication to climate, we believe is the one to make the tough calls and get the job done. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Maureen Bard. Council members, last week I came and described to you, as you'll remember, my unusual predicament of the inequality of height allowances for ADUs that the state has offered and you have opted to put in, into law. This week, I wanna make sure to draw your attention to how many homes that varied enforcement potentially affects. I think the clerk has um, a, a PDF, which is actually from your city packet. Is it up? No. It's, it's a picture of the corridor, of the transit corridor and the boundaries. 
And as you know, that green section is anyone within a half mile. Um, if you look at that carefully, you'll see how ziggy-zaggy that is. And you'll see that I am far from alone in my predicament at being on the border and with neighbors who will have a higher ADU than I will have. I counted last night the number of blocks bisected by the corridor's borders. There are approximately 100 blocks that have green on one side and no green on the other. That means at a minimum, 100 residents won't have the same height allowance as their next door or rear neighbor. And if they're on a block like mine in which the whole block borders that green thing, that green line, multiple properties could have rear neighbors who have a taller ADU height allowance. I just want to once again reiterate, the city needs to reconsider this unfair division among its residents. And I can suggest two options for ways you might wanna deal with that. One is messier. It's to draw a border that's a zigzag along streets to at least avoid having next door and rear neighbors with different limits. But the city also has a less complicated and more equitable option. And that is to raise that ADU height to 18 feet for everyone in the city. I hope you will act on this option very soon, keeping in mind that that increased height will improve the living space for whoever is living in that ADU, as well as potentially enable less lot coverage for all of our neighborhoods. And before I go, I just wanna introduce that I have brought a couple of our, who have come voluntarily to residents from other parts of town, not just where I live. Um, Mike Genezareth from Crescent Park and Deborah Sobel who lives in Leland Manor. So um, that's all for today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Bruce Carney. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I am a resident of Mountain View, and the chair of Carbon Free Mountain View, a grassroots environmental group, and um, am a member of the board of Carbon Free Silicon Valley, also a spin out. Both of these groups were inspired by the example of the Palo Alto residents who founded Carbon Free Palo Alto. And I know sometimes when a city is asked to do something on the leading edge, the comment is made, well, we're one small community. What difference does it make if we get out there ahead of the head of the parade? And at least one part of the answer is that you'll inspire others to join your parade. And certainly I can speak from personal experience to say that because of Palo Alto residents, because of Carbon Free Palo Alto, Carbon Free Mountain View was able to persuade cities throughout Silicon Valley to, to form Silicon Valley Clean Energy. We can't take 100% of the credit, but believe me, if we had not been there going to city council meetings up and down Santa Clara County back in 2014-15, Silicon Valley Clean Energy would not be as large as it is or it would not have started when it did. There was a three-part series that Ken Burns put together called America and the Holocaust. Not a cheerful subject, and so my wife and I never got around to watching it until just today. And this morning I was watching and there was a line that really struck me about America's anti-Semitic response to the plight of Jews in Europe. And the answer was, or the comment was, the best time to stop a Holocaust is it before it starts. And I think there's an environmental Holocaust that the young people behind me and on the right are likely to experience if we don't stop it before it starts. And so one of the ways we do that is to get out ahead of this problem, to really look at this short time window available to us. And speaking of short time windows, you know, from now until 2030 is seven years. All of, all of America's involvement in World War II took place in less than four years. It's really amazing what this country can do when it puts all of its creative energies into one specific goal, in that case, it was to defending Western democracy. And in this case, it's to defend the climate that we have grown to love. And here in Palo Alto, we have one of the best climates anywhere. So let's hang on to it. 
Um, the last thing I would want to say is that when I worked at HP, one of the books we spent a lot of time thinking about was Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And one of those habits is to begin with the end in mind. And the end in this case is the end of flow of natural gas as soon as possible. I hope you will adopt that end and make it a reality. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Ken Horowitz, followed by Matt Schlegel. Yeah, good evening, Ken Horowitz. <clears throat> I live on Homer Avenue. I'm a Palo Alto resident. And um, I wanted to comment on item number 10 on your agenda, which is an information report. So I, I felt like I should comment on that one. And that one is in regards to the um, analysis, so to speak, of the projects for 2022, of which um, there were 65 major projects. And this is on uh, page, uh, well, it's item 10, page three. And uh, it indicates that you had 65 major projects for 2022, you completed 14, which is less than 20%. Not a good record. Obviously, um, you need to do better, or what I'm going to suggest later this evening when I come back at 8.30, is you begin to prioritize your priorities. Um, because it's obvious there's so many projects on this list. The one I particularly looked at was community health and safety. Uh, Mr. Horowitz? It's me. I was wondering, are you commenting on an agenda item? No, no, I'm commenting on the report in page the item 10. Page? On page 10. Okay. And item you. 10. Thank you. So I'm not, not no, commenting on the I'm agenda. Sorry to disturb you. Just this this is the information mm -hmm. report. And the only other one, and I'll be I'll be done in a second or so. Um, community health and safety. There was 20 projects listed, only two were completed. That's a 10% completion rate. So I just want to say that uh, I'm disappointed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Matt Schlegel, followed by Jeff Ball. Thank you. Do you remember when people smoked tobacco all the time? I do. I grew up with it. <clears throat> my mom was a smoker. My dad smoked until he died. All of my grandparents smoked. And do you recall how the tobacco companies lied to us? They knew the harm that smoking caused us, and yet they hired marketing firms to lie to us and convince us that smoking doesn't cause cancer. And when our friends and family were dying and it, the lies became obvious, we mustered the political will to prohibit them from lying to us. And once their disinformation stopped, we stopped smoking. We all stopped smoking. Now I'm surprised when I smell tobacco smoke. This past week, a report came out showing just how accurately Exxon knew 40 years ago the harm that burning fossil fuels, burning their products, were causing us. And rather than transitioning their business to one that causes less harm, instead they hired the same guys who convinced us that smoking doesn't cause cancer to convince us that burning fossil fuels doesn't cause climate collapse and mass extinction, all the while making us physically and mentally sick. So away we burn. Exxon knows. But they work hard to keep us believing that they're using their products don't, don't cause, doesn't cause harm. Short-term harm, mid-term harm, and long-term harm. And why? Exxon was in the news for another reason last week. Undoubtedly, you heard. They realized record annual profits in 2022, $56 billion. They're putting profit over planet and people. And that's why they do it. It's the same reason tobacco companies lied to us. And it's the reason why the fossil, fossil fuel companies continue lying to us. So in just a few years from now, we're going to consider people burning fossil fuels the same way we consider people who smoke tobacco. 
the fossil fuel burners will be the exception, not the rule. We've transformed society before and we'll do it again. And that's why I and Fridays for Future Palo Alto fully support having Palo Alto establish a sunset date for end of flow of dirty fossil fuel gas in our city for a cleaner, healthier city. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeff Ball. Let's not do that, please. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeff Ball, followed by Sydney Ernest. Hi. I want to speak to the importance of a gas sunset date for ending the flow of natural gas, and I will speak as an individual tonight. I'm speaking for myself, my family, and a lot of other people. I'm a member of the Palo Alto Rotary Club and serve as chair of the Climate Action Committee of Palo Alto Rotary Club. I've lived in Palo Alto downtown since 1977. I've watched all the changes. I've been part of it because I've lived here. We need your support as a council and as the leaders of the city of Palo Alto, you can create a context for our climate action work. This context helps us act with urgency and collaboratively in our quests to transform how we live on into a green future we can all love. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Sydney Ernest, followed by John Kelly. Hi, my name is Sydney Ernest. I'm 16, and I will be speaking on behalf of Fridays for the Future as well as the Sunrise Movement today. Um, let me start by asking um, pretty simple questions, um, which is you're all adults, I would assume. You can all vote, you can hold office, you can rent a car. Um, and I would assume as adults as well that um, you are more capable of judging when something poses dangerous risk to health and safety. Um, otherwise you wouldn't be in elected position. And I would assume as fully qualified adults, um, I wouldn't be here telling you about the impacts of inaction regarding carbon regulation and how it's a safety risk to individuals um, that additionally, um, it's a problem that we're not regulating um, the acceleration and the dire state of climate emergency we're currently facing. Now, my final question, do any of you trust fossil fuel companies? I know I sure don't. Um, I hope as adults, you would also make a judgment similar to that. Um, seeing as it's been released that Exxon and Shell and many other big contributors to climate change knew exactly what they were doing 40 years ago, yet they still manipulated systems to ensure their profit margins were greater than the people they killed in the process. It doesn't surprise me that the government submitted to the hands of these companies when it came to regulating natural gas. By continuing to use fossil fuels, we effectively perpetuate these systems and allow these companies to continue profiting off of people. This is why a sunset bill is so vital for our future. Palo Alto is truly a leader, in my opinion, for Silicon Valley, which is a leader for California, which leads the US and the greater world. If we are able to pledge a sunset request my hope is it will lead the rest of the world in a migration away from the harmful fossil fuels. Pledging this would put our city in a place where we have fully done our part in locally eliminating harmful emissions that worsen the effects of climate change. This pledge means so much to my generations and the generations following us. And on behalf of youth, we hope that you can hand down the city to us knowing that you have done your part in reducing emissions and giving us a moonshot towards a livable future. Thank you for your consideration and have a lovely rest of your night. And Madam Clerk, um, let's uh, make sure that we, um, after the next speaker, that we close public comments. Thank you. Absolutely. Our next speaker is John Kelly. 
Mayor Ku, Vice Mayor Stone, Council Members, I'd like to speak to you about four items very quickly. Uh, the first is I'd just like to associate myself with the remarks of the representatives of 350.org and the other organizations who've spoken to you about uh, creating a sunset date for the use, use of methane in Palo Alto. Uh, just two points on that. I think that the speakers who have preceded me on this point really haven't emphasized the health aspects of this problem as much as they could have. So I would commend that you read those, read the studies on that. They're really quite dire and it ties into what the one gentleman was talking about with smoking. Uh, the second point is I haven't heard anyone talk about a specific date. Maybe that's in the written correspondence you've received. I would simply suggest that you, you not only commit yourselves to having a sunset date, but that you, you put a date certain that's in there before January 1, 2027. If we can do this uh, at all, we can certainly do it in four years. You're gonna take a lot of heat for doing it, but I think committing yourselves to doing it before the next election is really telling the city and the community at large how you feel about this. The second point is, I'm not sure any of you are aware, but every time I walk in here, there's a sign telling me I have to wear a mask in this chamber and I have to wear a mask when I'm speaking to you. I don't see many people wearing masks who are speaking at the dais. I would urge you to either get rid of that sign or change the language on it, but make clear to people what the rules are. I, I really don't think that's, that's fair or considerate. The third point is many of you have probably seen Dave Price's editorial uh, in the Daily Post today. I hope you've all taken a look at it and read it and taken it seriously. I particularly want to, uh, I'm not gonna quote this at length, but I do wanna quote part of it. Now that the surplus has been discovered, the city is trying to downplay it by saying that the $40.6 million was restricted. This is not the kind of thing that the council should leave unanswered or responded to. I don't know what the facts are. I don't know if Mr. Price knows what the facts are, but I believe it's the duty of the finance committee and the council to, resp to respond to this thoroughly, accurately, and quickly. And if this isn't at the top of the finance committee's meeting for its next, uh, at top of the agenda for its next meeting, I urge you to put it there. And lastly, I was intending to be here uh, <laughs> for the discussion about the priorities. So just as a matter of, a matter of personal privilege, I wanna indicate we've had a family, maybe not an emergency, but an important event in our family. I need to take my wife to the airport. Um, so if I can get back before you get to the priorities and speak at that time, I will. And if not, I'll write to you. I think there's some really important things that you need to change in your priorities, not least of which is adding a progressive municipal carbon tax to your discussion of climate issues. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And Madam Mayor, there were several um, speaker signups for actually part of the first group of speakers. So we've readjusted the list. Our next speaker is online and it's Aram James. In reference to the last speaker commenting on the uh, city didn't, uh, Dave Price's editorial today, the only council member that voted against putting the measure on the ballot uh, that was hidden from us, that we had $40 million in reserve, we didn't need it to reach out to the voters, was the person I expect to be our next mayor. That's Greg Tanaka. Thank you, Greg, for doing that. Everybody else uh, that was on the council at that time that had an opportunity to vote uh, didn't do their, their due diligence. So thank you for that, Greg. And, you know, uh, Madam Mayor, I took the comment from the city manager, are you gonna do this every week? Meaning changing uh, items back and forth as a snide comment and something to try to control you. You may feel different, but there's Mr. Tanaka trying to do his power play again. Um, and nobody really asked via the question that I wanted to ask, which is they say it's gonna be a minimum wage job. And that also means no collective uh, bargaining, and no benefits. And we're gonna let those folks drive our seniors around and our children around for you know, 350 an hour or a dollar an hour. And we haven't done, we're not paying them right. That, that to me is irresponsible. And again, I lay that on Mr. Shikata. Now last week, you know, he had a, an outburst. I may not get through the whole thing uh, on <clears throat> manager uh, comments. And that outburst was directed at me. It was inappropriate. I still haven't received the apology. 
but I'm going to start. I only have a minute and 17. We'll finish it next week. The statement that I read last week that it caused him to have the unprofessional outburst at me, and none of, none of you, by the way, uh, attempted to step in and sit, tell him, what are you doing? It's out of place to do it in manager's comments. You tried to hijack Mr. Uh, Mr. James' uh, trial by ambush, as I called it. But here was the statement. It's not the race, it's the culture and the Palo Alto police chief bender. Uh, it's all about the warrior culture, thus the insistence on maintaining deadly tasers and a canine unit, both of which he knows are weapons of torture used against almost exclusively on black and brown people. Mr. Shikata, are you telling me that, that, that canines and tasers are not primarily or almost exclusively used on black and brown people? If so, why don't you come forward with your data? I don't think you have it. Uh, next sentence, Mr. Andrew Binder had no intent, no in, has no intention of creating a culture ship in the leadership of the PAPD or in the rank and file of the PAPD. That's my opinion. I'm entitled to it. Only got eight seconds. I'll get back to this next week during oral communications. And I await somebody on council to, to tell him he shouldn't have done what he did. Uh, during uh, city manager comments, and for your apology, Mr. Shikata, which I imagine will never come. Still waiting. Okay, thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Debbie Mitels, followed by Sven Thiessen. Hello, good evening, members of the council. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to speak this evening. I wanted to speak on behalf of setting an end date for the use of methane gas in Palo Alto. As Andrea Guerra said, all the scientific evidence now points to 2030 as a tipping point when Earth will face irreversible changes in, as we continue with carbon emissions. I'm active not only as a member of the 350 Palo Alto Steering Committee, but also I'm the founder and co-chair of PICA, and Peninsula Interfaith Climate Action. We're an organization whose members come from about 30 faith-based congregations between San Mateo and Los Gatos. Our members are among the many local residents who are taking action themselves and within their congregations to switch from fossil fuels to clean electricity. Yes, if the city puts forth a law or an ordinance or a resolution to stop the use of fossil fuels by 2030, some people will complain. They'll complain about government overreach. But the reality of it is the climate disruption is not within the government's authority. That's happening because of the basic laws of nature, chemistry and physics. But it is within the purview of a city to set rules that can forestall major changes to Earth's chemistry. Responsible citizens are now moving forward to make changes in their homes, in their transportation, and others are waiting for guidance from responsible governments. Among those waiting for such guidance are businesses that build and remodel buildings, as well as people who are investing in their homes. With guidance from the city and a few years lead time, we will be able to make the changes in a timely way and whole new economic opportunities will be created. We need to give people the signal that burning gas appliances no longer are safe nor responsible. We need the city of Palo Alto to exercise the leadership we expect. And I'd just like to close by noting that the next speaker, Sven Thiessen has sent me a message saying he's on the way to the office. If he could be placed at the end, he would appreciate it. Thank you again for your time. Okay, thank you for your comments and we will move Sven Thiessen to the end. So our next speaker is Julia Zeitlin in person in the chamber. Good evening, council members. I hope you are doing well. I am Julia Zeitlin and the co-founder of the Palo Alto Student Climate Coalition. I wanted to take a moment to express my support for the 350 Palo Alto Climate Team's gas sunset date proposal letter. Despite the misleading name, there is nothing natural about burning natural gas. The substance is toxic and dangerous and its combustion in gas powered appliances like furnaces and gas stoves leads to leakage of chemicals like formaldehyde, benzene, carbon monoxide, and more. Not only are gas powered appliances harmful to indoor air quality and our health, but also detrimental to the environment. According to the NRDC, methane is more potent than carbon dioxide in terms of the greenhouse effect. In fact, pound for pound, its global warming impact is 25 times greater than that of carbon dioxide over a hundred year period. 
For the past several years, 350 and then PASC has encouraged the council to accelerate its climate efforts. You have done so with 80 by 30, strong reach codes and a carbon neutrality target. However, you, the new council, have the opportunity to make an even bolder and uniquely powerful statement that demonstrates clear leadership by putting a sunset date for gas flow in Palo Alto. Let's not kid ourselves. We won't be using natural gas as a fuel 30 years from now. It's simply not sustainable. We urge you to show your commitment to your priority of addressing climate, climate change by setting the state and declaring a definitive timeline to phase out the use of this toxic gas in homes and buildings. Students do what we are asking you to do all the time. Whenever, whenever I am handed a difficult assignment or project from school, the first thing I do is set a timeline for myself so I can check my progress and, and ensure that I will finish by the deadline. We urge you to follow this basic principle and do the same with your climate goals. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Robert Gould. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Robert Gould. After working as a pathologist at San Jose Kaiser for over 30 years, since 2012, I've been an associate adjunct professor at UCSF School of Medicine, working as a collaborator in our program on reproductive health and the environment. I've also been a member of the Santa Clara County Medical Associ Association for over 25 years, where we've worked to develop many policies for the California Medical Association, protective of public and environmental health. Since 1989, I've also been president of San Francisco Bay Physicians for Social Responsibility, for which I'm testifying today, representing many hundreds of health professionals throughout our region who speak for the health of our patients and communities who are increasingly harmed by rapidly advancing global heating and clearly connected issues of air pollution. In this capacity, I'm strongly urging you to support the call here for an expedited plan to sunset natural gas in Palo Alto. As eloquently addressed by Andrea Gar and others earlier, this would be a key step towards promoting building electrification and quickly ending our reliance on gas appliances that is health protective, not only for the climate benefits, but also because gas stoves and other appliances can be a large source of toxic pollution in homes, reaching levels of pollution that would be illegal in outdoor settings. Children, especially those of color, are particularly at risk of respiratory illnesses such as asthma associated with gas appliance pollution and lower income households may be at higher risk of exposure. So as one example, a 2013 meta-analysis looking at the association between gas stoves and childhood asthma found children in homes with gas stoves have a 42% increased risk of experienced asthma symptoms or current asthma, a 24% increased risk of ever being diagnosed with asthma by a doctor, and an overall 32% increased risk of both current and lifetime asthma. In addition, there's mounting evidence linking combustion-related air pollution with adverse brain development. A 2009 study found evidence that an infant through preschool age, early life exposures to age four to indoor air pollution from gas appliances may be related to impaired cognitive function and may increase the risk of, increase the risk of developing attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. These health concerns have just been underscored by a new scientific report demonstrating that gas piped into millions of California homes contain hazardous air pollution, pollutants, including benzene, a chemical strongly linked to malignancies such as leukemia, and that each year California gas appliances and infrastructure leak the same amount of benzene as is emitted by nearly 60,000 cars. In concluding, by supporting a gas sunset date, Palo Alto would position itself as an inspiring leader among the many municipalities in California that are supporting a rapid end of fossil gas use in recognition of numerous benefits of, to community health, safety, and a stable climate future afforded by this transformation. Thank you for providing me and the rest of us the time to speak to you tonight. Thank you for your comments. Perhaps and you our, can snap your fingers instead of clapping. Thank you. Our last speaker is Sven Thiessen. Sven, are you present? Yeah. 
Madam Mayor, we have no response online and it doesn't appear he's in the chamber. Yeah, I think Sven is driving here. Okay, can you hear me? Oh, okay. yes, we can. Thank you. I apologize. Yes, I am driving in a carbon free electric vehicle. Thank you, Palo Alto, for providing that carbon free electricity. I apologize. As a business owner, father, man of faith, and someone living and has lived in an all electric house, I am calling in in extremely strong support for a sundown date for our natural gas use. As you've heard from many others before, there are many reasons why, but I would like to start with from a business perspective. And what businesses want is certainty and as much certainty as can be provided. And that would be a, having a date knowing with certainty that the natural gas was going to be shut off. So certainty. Second of all, from a father perspective, my children, your children, everybody's kids is, are not growing up in the climate, in the weather that we had growing up. The droughts, the fires, that air quality, that incredibly poor air quality we experienced two years ago with all of the fires is not normal. We are giving them a not normal climate. We enjoyed that normal client climate. It's not fair to them to give them a pile of shit later on and ask them to deal with it. It's not right. It's not fair. It's not the fairness that we teach our kids. So that's the dad part. Then the man of faith, that's just given. And then I want to talk about the all electric home that we live in. When you ask my wife, what are the two things that you can, you could not take away from her hands? She would say the electric car and the induction stove and the, and both for the same reason, convenience. When we want to fry something, we simply put a piece of newspaper between the frying pan and the top of the stove and fry away. Cleanup is so easy because we just take that fat encrusted piece of paper, ball it up and put it in the compost. There's very little cleanup. And when we talk about safety from induction, it's massive. It's really, you have to work hard to burn yourself with an induction stove. I mean, really hard because I've tried. And when we talk about how quickly it cooks things, it's amazing. It, it just simply works. And I challenge anyone with a natural gas stove to take the boil the pasta challenge with me because the induction stove just works that well. And I would encourage you all to come over and tour my house just to see these benefits. And the same thing goes for the electric car. Yes, we're asking people to do things ahead of time of when they would have done them, but it's just the new normal and it's okay. I'm asking for your leadership, your boldness to stop speaking words of action and actually take action. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. That's our last request to speak. Thank you. Um, now we'll move to the consent calendar. Madam Mayor, if I could, there was one comment I neglected to make under agenda comments, which are agenda changes, which is to note for the public's awareness that on item number four on your consent uh, calendar agenda, staff does have a revised recommendation. It would be to uh, recommend the contract be awarded for an, an initial one year term. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we'll go to public comments again on items on the consent calendar. Okay. Madam Mayor, we don't have any requests for the consent calendar. Very good. Uh, I'll bring it back to council. Is there any um, comments? No votes, poll. Council Member Burt. I would like to um, remove item four from consent. I would like to also uh, pull um, consent item number four. Uh, Vice Mayor Stone. I'll pull four, four as well. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Tanaka. No on five. No on five.
Okay. Uh, in that case, uh, if you'll call the vote. Yes, we have to move the consent calendar, please. I move uh, the consent calendar with uh, the um, changes noted, which appear to mean that item four would be pulled and council member Tanaka is no on five. Second. Very good. Will you please take the vote, Madam Clerk? Can you please re repeat who the seconder was? Lowing. 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 Thank you, sir. Okay, Vice Mayor Stone? Yes. Councilmember Burt? Yes. Councilmember Vinker? Yes. Councilmember Lowing? Councilmember yes. Thank you. Councilmember Lithcott Hames? Yes. Mayor Koo? Yes. And Councilmember Tanaka? Yes. Motion carries unanimously for items two, three, and six to one on item five. Thank you. And uh, Councilmember Tanaka, would you like to speak to your no vote on number five? Yes, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, actually, can I ask the clerk so I could share my screen, please? Uh, you have to stop uh, sharing in order for me to share. Thank you. Um, so, Let's see here. Hopefully I got this right. Can you guys see my screen? No. Okay, I think it's working. Okay, great. So um, item five, um, it's basically a conversation increase. And I, I believe right now, this is actually very tone deaf. Um, I think probably every day, if. Uh, more often, we see mass tech layoffs. We know that people in our community, a lot of them work in tech. A lot of jobs depend on dollars that tech people spend. And this year, I could tell you, no one in tech is getting a raise. In fact, many people are losing their jobs, even the mightiest companies, be it Google, Facebook, whatever, people are getting laid off. So, um, and not only are people getting laid off and there's no raises, but a lot of people in tech, their compensation is based off of stock, off of equity. And what's happening here is not only are they uh, getting laid off and not getting raises, but their compensation is also falling, sometimes dramatically, maybe half or two thirds. So they're getting much, much less than before. At the same time, our community is facing sky high utility rates. And you know, we like to say, oh, it's just because the natural gas prices are high or because the commodity cost, costs are high. But it's not just that. It's also because the ballot measures, we transferred funding from our utilities to our general fund to bolster these raises. Now, our staff already gets every other Friday off. And we're, in this proposal, this consent item, we're going to be giving an extra holiday day as well. Now, this at a time when our community, they're getting paid less, they're getting laid off, they're not getting raises. In fact, most of the companies are cutting back all the benefits. No more you know, free dry, dry cleaning, none of that stuff. A lot of the stuff is going away, no more free lunch. But it, our city is going the other way, which is really ironic right now, given the situation that a lot of our people in our community face today. Plus, we're gonna get cash bonuses, right? Just think about that. Now we have to say, well, um, you know, what are the compensation of the people working at our city? For these two groups that we're talking about, it's $347,000 a year annually and 191,000 annually. Now, I think a lot of people in our community are not paid, do not have that kind of salary. That is a lot of money. $340,000 a year, $191,000 a year in compensation. And, you know, I, I do realize that there are some positions in our city that um, are hard to fill. And what I think we should be doing for that is we should be doing, doing focused pay increases. Those, there's some positions that we really need to do dramatic increases. And I, I know some of this proposal here has a little bit of that, but it doesn't go far enough. There should not just be a blanket raise across the board. Also, if you look at the total cost of this, which is about $12.2 million, and this is just two of our seven groups, um, you know, our, the ballot measure, um, if you read it, it says preserving 911 services. If we were really being honest about what's happening in this ballot measure, it should have been said going to staff raises at a time when our community are facing layoffs. So I think this is incredibly inappropriate to be doing at a time when people in our community are, are suffering. Thank you. 
thank you. Um, next up is city manager comments. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, let's see. So I would like to note with the approval of the consent calendar, uh, the notable agreements that have been approved with our uh, both International Association of Firefighters, as well as the Service Employees International Union. Uh, those two bargaining groups represent roughly uh, 660 employees uh, that are providing services uh, to the Palo Alto community, including our line staff in utilities, community services, public works, and libraries. And uh, I'm sure uh, folks, uh, uh, know, if not perhaps assume, uh, that the firefighters are also uh, providing services on uh, 24-7, 365 basis uh, for the Palo Alto community. So simply like to say thank you uh, to the city council for approving that agreement, as well as to uh, both our bargaining units, as well as all of the, the hundreds of employees uh, that are covered uh, through these two agreements. So thank you for that. Let's uh, proceed to the next slide, please. Okay, in the context of uh, everything going on, it's almost uh, easy to forget about the pandemic, uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, let's uh, uh, provide a quick update on uh, the developments this week, notably, and actually as a part of perhaps uh, transitioning to the new normal, the County of Santa Clara has announced uh, that it will be closing the mass testing and vaccination sites that have been operating over the last many months uh, as of the end of February. So on February 28th, the county will be closing its remaining uh, COVID-19 vaccination and testing sites. The county has uh, indicated a desire to ensure community members are aware that they should continue to go to their medical providers, medical service providers uh, for both testing and vaccination. And for those that do not have uh, other uh, uh, health plans uh, to make access to the county's health system. Uh, also noting that uh, this reflects the statewide uh, end of emergency declarations again at the end of February and uh, that uh, Again, in moving into the new normal, that uh, the uh, primary health pro health providers will be uh, through your own, uh, both personal as well as publicly available health plans. Uh, SCCfreevax.org remains a primary resource uh, for additional information going forward. Next slide, please. Then to touch upon uh, the uh, utility bills, I know the city council and, uh, and our utilities advisory commission has been receiving uh, uh, certainly communications from community members on this topic. It's uh, clearly a, a topic of great concern, uh, really including certainly Palo Alto, but communities uh, throughout California, as we have seen a uh, spike uh, costs uh, throughout California, unlike the rest of the, con the country. Uh, as we have been uh, communicating since December, this high gas cost has been an issue of great concern and would note that on our city's homepage, we have a number of resources available, including the availability of free energy assessments uh, for the purpose of evaluating energy efficiency at homes, as well as extended uh, payment arrangements. The good news is that as of uh, last week, uh, we did receive word that the February costs have decreased from what had been $4 per therm in the month of January to $1.26 uh, in the month of, month of February. Now, given uh, billing months, uh, most customers will see that change occur throughout the month of February into March uh, with uh, lower bills uh, really arriving in March. Uh, but again, we should expect to see some transition to that over the next few weeks. Uh, we have heard some concern that the general fund would be benefiting from these high costs, and I can tell you that that is not the case. Uh, we will have uh, staff returning to our finance committee over the next month in uh, bringing some uh, follow-up actions that will reinforce uh, policy direction uh, to reflect uh, both the uh, limits on the 
uh, gas uh, transfer, the tra transfer to the general fund, as well as related to the uh, hydro adjuster that has been made to the uh, electric rates. Uh, again, that will be coming to the finance committee next month. Next slide, please. Then in terms of ongoing activities, uh, notably the Charleston Rastradero uh, corridor improvements, that there are a couple of dates of traffic signal work that we want community members to be aware of because they may involve some traffic delays. One is at the intersection of Fabian and East Charleston scheduled for this Wednesday that there will be uh, work during the daylight hours, daytime hours at on the traffic signal. And so as a result, staff is expecting some traffic uh, congestion impacts at that intersection. So uh, motorists and other community members in that area should plan accordingly. And then at the intersection of El Camino Real and Rostradero, that will be night work. So it'll be overnight work on February 16th. Uh, so would hopefully not affect as many people, but nonetheless for anyone in the area and traveling through the area, uh, notable that work will be proceeding there. Next slide, please. Then uh, actually a very important date uh, for anyone who is interested in a summer camp registration for 2023. And we know that uh, parents, we've heard from parents, this is a very important date on Thursday, February 9th. It's when the Palo Alto registration, uh, Palo Alto Regis, ah, excuse me, resident registration uh, will begin at 8.30 a.m. And uh, our community services staff are eagerly anticipating uh, not only the registration, but actually uh, getting to the summer camps. As uh, I'm sure the council knows, this is a, a major uh, ramp up, uh, both for staffing and activities into the summer. Uh, so looking forward uh, to this program. And again, registration begins this Thursday, February 9th at 8.30 a.m. for residents and next week for non-residents. Information, uh, additional information is available at cityofpaloalto.org slash summer camps. Next slide, please. Then uh, also mentioned this last week, but uh, very important to the uh, work of the city and the work uh, by community members uh, for the community, the Palo Alto community, uh, is the uh, recruitment ongoing for open uh, seats on the boards and commissions. So to uh, note this de deadline of February 28th at 4.30 p.m. for applications and that we have openings available or that uh, appointments will be made on the historic Resources Board, the Human Relations Commission, the Parks and Recreation Commission, Planning and Transportation Commission, and U Utilities Advisory Commission, all very important advisory boards to the City Council. Uh, additional information there on our homepage under news. Next slide, please. Then finally, uh, touching on upcoming items, and let's see if make sure I get uh, any changes that were discussed earlier uh, this evening correct. Next week, we have two study sessions scheduled, the uh, economic development uh, ongoing study. So that will be uh, the first study session and a second study session on the Buena Vista Mobile Home Park, uh, both uh, current uh, activities and uh, future plans. Then on your action agenda, there will be your mid year budget review. And what's listed here as the council committee work plans will be uh, pushed off to a future date. And in its place, we will have the long range, long range financial forecast. Thank you very much, Mayor. Then uh, looking forward uh, to recognizing that there will be no council meeting on February 20th, that on the 27th, we'll be uh, returning with discussion of your uh, of the uh, parklet program around town, as well as the item uh, that was pulled from your consent agenda related to uh, e-bike policies in parks and open spaces. Then uh, just noting a number of uh, further uh, future items in March and beyond. And with that, I'll stop. I believe that's my last slide. Back to you, Mayor. Thank you, City Manager. Um, next item up is council member questions, comments, and announcements. Well, um, and I actually had a question, have a question. Two questions on the City Manager comments first, if that's okay. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
So I, I just wanted to uh, uh, ask a follow-up, uh, a couple follow-up questions. So one of the public speakers alluded to our item 10, which is not coming for discussion. It's an informational item in our packet and asserted that we only had 10 or uh, 14 of our 65 uh, major projects uh, completed. But as I read the report, um, those are uh, for the most part, multi-year projects and that there's actually, it's clearly listed in a column there that 10 of the 65 are uh, uh, behind schedule and 55 are on schedule. Is that a correct interpretation? Certainly uh, correct, uh, Councilmember Vert, in terms of the um, expectation that many of the projects were established as multi-year projects. We're not designed in order to suggest that they should be completed by the end of the calendar year. Now, I don't have those statistics right in front of me, so I can't confirm uh, the numbers you just cited. Okay. And then um, on your comments on the utility rates, uh, bullet number three says uh, some of these issues have eased and their decline from $4 a therm to one twenty six a therm for methane. Um, is, is that one twenty six? does that return us to a normal level or where it, it because that's a, a big range of easing uh, from easing a little bit to getting back to normal? Yes, uh, let's see. The gas prices fluctuate every month. And so I don't have a historical comparison of how that 126 for February would compare to prior Februarys, which, which is typical. We do see seasonal fluctuations as well as market uh, conditions. So uh, to directly respond to your question, I can't exactly say how uh, that would compare uh, to uh, what expectations would be going forward. Well, I would say that the public really needs to understand on kind of orders of magnitude. We had this huge spike that went on throughout the state and actually most Western states, and it was a massive spike. We were fearful that it would continue for multiple months and without really knowing when it would decline. It's declined more rapidly than uh, anyone had projected, which is great news. Question everybody has is, are we back to about what we normally pay for gas? And I think the public needs to know that right away, uh, even along with what you've already clarified, when it'll start showing up in their bills. I'll ask staff to do some follow up on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll go to council member questions, comments, and announcements. Uh, Council Member Lithcote Haynes. Madam Mayor, would it be appropriate to mention um, the fact that uh, we got word today as members of this community that a dear resident and friend to many, Melissa Baton Caswell passed away today. And um, for those who are hearing it for the first time through my words, I'm sorry to, um, to inform you this way, and yet as a council, we want to recognize, um, my phone is ringing for some reason, want to recognize the passing of a colleague and a friend who served us on the school board and served the Santa Clara County boards of school boards and has served Castilea and in so many other capacities. I won't begin to try to name all of that here, but simply to recognize that we've lost a cherished member of our community. And I would love to just take a moment of silence for Melissa Baton Caswell. Thank you. And Madam Mayor, I have something positive to report now um, that we've um, acknowledged Melissa's passing. Um, on a completely positive note, I want to commend the young people at Gunn High School who today put on their 13th ever TEDx Gunn High School, a very rigorous day of speakers and audience members well prepared. Um, they pulled off a terrific event. I had the privilege of being one of the people there. It's very unusual for a high school to pull off a TEDx event. TEDx events happen around the world, dozens a day. 
and the fact that one of our high schools, and perhaps Pally does this too, I'm not aware, um, at least one of our high schools is doing it on a regular basis, shows the caliber of students that um, we have the pleasure of knowing in our amazing city. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Vinker. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, <clears throat> and thank you, Council Member um, Lithcott Hames, for uh, that remembrance. Um, on council, we deal with a lot of the city's challenges, and I too wanted to lift up a couple of joys. Um, to do our work, we of course have to partner with both residents and staff. And I wanna uh, lift up that this week on next door, which I don't typically read, but happened to notice that there was a shout out to Palo Alto Animal Control Officer uh, Washington. and. Every comment after that was positive. And I just wanted to lift that up because that is a rarity and something that we should all be proud of. Um, so kudos to Officer Washington. Um, secondly, I just wanna state what a joy it is to sit in this chamber and listen to so many thoughtful and passionate public comments as we saw tonight. I'm not allowed to respond substantively and will not, but just the sheer, you know, the, 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 the preparation, the, the uh, patience uh, to address us like that is something I'm very grateful for. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Lawing. Yeah, I just wanted to <clears throat> take a moment to, to note what we all know that there was a <clears throat> horrible fire in Midtown uh, this week. And uh, the ultimate sadness uh, is that, you know, there were four vibrant retailers and now they're gone. You know, we have enough problem with retailers, uh, with retail shops. Um, I, I just went down there the day afterwards because I just was feeling so bad and just to see if I could run into any of the owners. And luckily I did. I ran, ran into the owners of uh, uh, Palo Alto Wine and Spirits as well as uh, Bills. And talk to them and they were basically trying to make the best of it, which I appreciated, but I felt like I just needed to express our condolences, uh, which I did obviously on my behalf, but I used my city council title um, because I wanted to express it for, for all of us. And um, <clears throat> that building I'm sure is gone. It's been red tagged. Three of them are red tagged and one is yellow tagged. So uh, they're gonna have to find new spaces or, uh, and, and if they do, um, Obviously, it'll be grandfathered in for the construction and so on, but uh, hope we can help them in any way possible to get back in business as soon as possible. Thank you, Council Member Lowing. Council Member Burt. Thank you. Um, so first, I want to um, uh, share uh, with Council Member Lithgott Ames the uh, loss we've had of uh, Melissa Baton Caswell. And for those who um, uh, have known her and, and followed her um, uh, struggles in recent years with uh, her battles, uh, uh, she was just incredibly courageous throughout this entire period of time, um, maintained a, a, a very positive approach and, and was a real inspiration. Uh, and before hearing of the loss of Melissa today, um, I had, uh, also wanted to bring forward that we recently lost one of the real environmental titans of our community, Walt Hayes, who had lived an incredibly full life um, and also uh, was a model to all of us as he was in declining health and continuing to just engage in a very positive way with uh, members of the community who greatly appreciate his contributions over decades. Um, on a separate subject, uh, uh, most of you may have heard that uh, we had major developments in our regional transportation and transit programs. Caltrain received um, 367 million in funding uh, from the, the major grant source, an additional 43 million. And those two funds combined fill the gap on completing the electrification uh, of Caltrain, which they, uh, believe will still be uh, operational um, by the end of next year. Um, and at the same time, uh, VTA received $375 million toward uh, the BART um, phase two project, uh, which 
uh, completes part two, uh, downtown San Jose and Santa Clara. They still are awaiting additional um, response on additional federal funds, but uh, they're very hopeful on that. Um, and then lastly, at the Caltrain board meeting, uh, we, we adopted negotiating guidelines for dealing with this, um, the San Francisco and the extension of the um, undergrounding of Caltrain uh, to what's called a DTX terminal. Um, and what we uh, adopted was uh, different from the initial staff proposal and the change was really to assure that um, uh, what we agreed to was consistent with our 2040 master plan and specifically discussed was um, reviewing the relative importance and priority of funding for the DTX terminal uh, grade separations and the other station improvements, including Deardon and others, and to not have the DTX supersede uh, those other priorities. And so that was adopted uh, as now our negotiating policy. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Tanaka. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so first of all, I just want to say I, I do like the idea of having this earlier versus late at night. Uh, it's, it's probably good to have right off the city manager comments. So I think uh, I think this was a good move. And I'm glad that we are going to be doing this um, as we voted on um, earlier. So uh, one, one thing I want to just say is that, um, and one of the public speakers mentioned this, but um, I did notice that the city manager does use his city manager comments to kind of retort people, right? So whether it's a public speaker or myself, who you know I complain a lot on consent calendar, but you know the topics are not agendized, so we don't we can't have a dialogue on it, and so I don't think it's appropriate for the city manager to be either. Um, retorting someone in the public or even city council members, uh, unless it's actually agendized, because we're not supposed to talk about things that aren't agendized, at least as far as I understand. The second thing is um, mask policy. Yeah, so I also I also wondered about that too, because we have this mask policy, but I don't I think a lot of us aren't following it anymore. So I don't I don't know really what the policy is anymore. So I think that would be good to clarify here in our in our chambers. And the last question I have for staff is. Um, at the survey results, um, Kim told me that she would send me a CSV file, and I've been following up uh, several times um, over the past uh, couple of weeks, and I still haven't got it or any response from my email on the CSV file. So I don't know if staff can uh, help me with that, but I emailed you the city manager uh, two times already, as well as Chantel, and there's been no response. So if that could be taken care of, I'd really appreciate uh, the commitment you guys made at that meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I just have one announcement to make that we will be forming a ad hoc committee, uh, the Stanford ad hoc committee. Um, so I'll have more um, after discussion with the city manager. That's all for now. Um, next agenda item. <clears throat> We will now briefly adjourn the special council meeting and call to order a meeting of the Public Improvement Corporation Board. The City Council serves as the board for the Public Improvement Corporation. Tonight, we meet as the Public Inf uh, Improvement Corporation Board for the purpose of approval of the fiscal year 2022 Palo Alto Public Improvement Corporation annual financial statements. The financial statements are audited annually and required and require board approval. For the record, please note that all members of the Public Improvement Corporation are present. Oh, she'll be back. <laughs> okay, this, this, do we have to, we can go move forward. Um, does staff have a presentation? Yes, hello. Um, Christine Peras, Assistant Director of ASD. Um, we don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but we do have some verbal comments. Um, the Public Improvement Corporation is um, a nonprofit that is led by the city and enables the city to issue um, certificates of pr participation to finance capital improvements in accordance with federal uh, laws and guidance from the California Debt and Investment Advisory Commission. Um, the PIC currently has three outstanding COPs totaling 
5.6 million in outstanding principal. Um, the PIG financial statements were audited by the city's external auditor, MGO, who issued a clean audit opinion and no audit findings. Um, and these are the statements that staff is uh, presenting before you and seeking approval. And that concludes my verbal comments. Thank you. Um, so is there any request for public comment, Madam Clerk? No, Madam Mayor, we don't have any requests to speak. Okay, thank you. So we'll bring it back to council. Does council have any comments or um, questions? I'm sorry, it's not the council, it's the board. Thank you. I don't see any lights. Um, I would like to ask for just some clarification. So we have um, uh, city buildings that are put up as collateral. So I wanna just confirm. So fire station one was collateral for the Palo Alto Municipal Golf Course. And then has that changed since we finished the golf course? Sure, um, I'll take that question. Uh, Mayor Ku, Kylie Nose, Administrative Services Director. Um, the collateral that the city puts up when we issue these debt, um, these uh, debt obligations, we will typically put something like the fire station one up. However, once that capital improvement um, becomes a useful asset, so it's you know past all building inspections, then typically what we do is we transfer the collateral to the asset itself. So um, for example, the public safety building right now that's under construction, while it's under construction, we're using existing city facilities as collateral. However, once it's constructed and occupied, we will shift the collateral to the building itself. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you're not very clear. Can you um, raise your volume, please, Tarun? Are now? No, Taryn, it's okay. I think we're we are okay. If you want to teams me, then we can. I'll try and if there's anything else. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I still see no lights. So with that, um, I'd like to move to approve the fiscal year 2022 annual financial report for the Palo Alto Public Improvement Corporation. Second. Thank you, Council Member Lithcutt Hames. I'm sorry, Board Member Lithcutt Hames. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I don't think I need to speak to my motion. Uh, board member Hames, uh, Lithgard Hames. No, I've seen no need to speak to it. Thank you. Thank you. With that, will you please um, take the votes, Madam Clerk? Yes, ma'am. Board member Lowing? Yes. Chair Ku? Yes. Board member Burt? Yes. Board member Tanaka? Yes. Vice Chair Stone? Yes. Board member Vinker? Yes. Board member Lithcott Hames? Yes. Motion carries six to one. Thank you. Um, we now adjourn the Public Improvement Actually, Corporation um, board meeting and reconvene the council. I'm sorry. Hold on a second. It, council member Tanaka was saying, I think he was a yes on that. Yes, I voted yes. Oh, thank you for the clarification. The motion carries unanimously. So do we have all the votes counted? Seven zero, right? All right. I'm sorry, I didn't see the light. Um, thank you. We will now adjourn the Public Improvement Corporation board meeting and reconvene the council meeting. And all members are present for the city council. Although um, I was kind of wondering, yes. Yes. yes, I think my colleagues would like a break. <laughs> I'm sorry. So we'll take uh, seven minutes and return at 732. 
Thank you, Madam Clerk. Okay, we're going to get started and go to action items now. And the first item is item seven, discussion regarding gas-powered leaf blower enforcement and possible direction to prepare an amendment to the noise ordinance and resolution to adjust financial penalties for violations in residential neighborhoods to facilitate compliance. Staff, hello. Oh, uh, John Late is uh, on camera to present. I'm Amy French, and this is Craig Hartley. Good evening, Mayor and, and uh, City Council. Thank you for that, Amy. Um, as Amy noted, Jonathan Late, Director for uh, Planning and, and Development Services. Um, I wanted to, uh, before you, Amy, just noted, uh, you have uh, Amy is our Chief Planning Official, and, and Craig Hartley is our uh, uh, second of two or, or one of two uh, code enforcement officers that we have with the city. Uh, Craig was hired about 10 months ago and uh, with the goal and focus to really help the city advance its um, enforcement efforts related to uh, gas powered leaf blowers. And um, Craig is here this evening to help answer any operational um, questions that the council may have uh, relative to our approach and, and how we are um, managing uh, leaf blowers, but also perhaps more importantly, to associate a face and a name with the city's effort in this regard. Um, uh, Madam Clerk, if we can have the next slide, please. So um, the staff report that was included in your packet uh, touched on a, a number of points, including you know, the reasons why the city regulates gas-powered leaf blowers uh, today with air pollution and, and noise pollution being some primary concerns. It uh, documents how the uh, authority to uh, allow leaf blowers in certain parts of the city, whether gas or electric, are set forth in the, uh, the noise ordinance. Um, we provided information about the volume of calls that we get with respect to leaf blowers, and we noted many of the challenges that we have in trying to enforce the regulations that are on um, the books today. Um, we also noted that the city is taking uh, some considerable efforts, and the council approved last in last year's uh, budget and appropriation to purchase new um, electric or battery-powered leaf blowers that are Community Services Department and our Public Works Departments uh, have begun to um, operationalize and use in their day-to-day -day work. And the vast majority of their um, use with leaf blowers is, are now either battery or uh, electric, except where there presents some uh, safety issues. Um, but for the, you know, by and large, it's mostly uh, gas and electric uh, leaf blowers in uh, use uh, today uh, by the city. Next slide, please. And so um, the, the reason that we're here uh, this evening before council is really to just get some direction on um, some of the uh, uh, strategies that are included in the report to improve our effectiveness in implementing the uh, leaf blower ban. And again, gas leaf blowers are, are only currently um, uh, restricted in residential areas, um, but our ability to um, help with uh, compliance with that regulation is really in, in many ways hampered by the existing regulations that we have. So in our staff report, we identify uh, three areas that we think could be adjusted to improve that effectiveness. Uh, one is to clarify that um, it's a violation of the code to operate a, uh, a gas-powered leaf blower in a residential zone or to allow such operation to take place on a um, residential property. This would give us the um, citation authority to cite the operator and the property owner uh, of uh, two separate uh, offenses of the code. The other change is to uh, remove this five-day uh, notice of violation um, and an opportunity to cure um, before we issue a, um, a notice of violation. You would think it'd be fairly easy to just come back a, a week later uh, or two weeks later to uh, observe a violation and, and issue a citation. But as Craig can report, um, that's very difficult in, in practice and actuality. And we have not been very successful at being able to catch a subsequent violation taking place in order to cite um, a, a violator uh, of that provision. 
And then uh, thirdly, there's the uh, fee schedule, uh, the penalty fee schedule, which um, is not at a um, an amount that is uh, serves as a any kind of significant deterrent. And so we present to the council some options on how that might be adjusted. Next slide, please. So before we would want to, uh, so that's going to take us a couple of months if we get the council's direction this evening to go ahead and advance these or, or other modifications to the noise ordinance. Uh, that'll take us a couple of months to make those changes. And in that time, uh, we would really uh, up our public engagement with the community and continue efforts that we've made, but also expand in a few other areas so that we're doing the, uh, the best that we can to get the word out before we begin to start issuing citations. And so you can see on the screen and also in the staff report, we've identified uh, a number of uh, ways that we can do this, including using the variety of uh, social media tools that are available to us, but also in-person conversations with um, uh, professional landscapers and property owners and meeting with residents in neighborhood meetings, which Craig has already uh, been doing and we would continue to do. I want to note that you've received some uh, suggesting that the city go further uh, with an all out ban of uh, leaf blowers, uh, gas powered leaf blowers uh, citywide. Um, these are some policy considerations that we could you know, hear from council on how you might want to proceed on that. But tonight we're presenting you some discrete changes to help improve our effectiveness in, in residential areas. Next slide, please. So um, I won't read this, but it's just the formal recommendation that's included in your staff report that provides a little bit more detail to the staff uh, proposal. And uh, you can go to the next slide and that will conclude the presentation. Um, staff uh, is available to answer questions that you may have. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, let me think. Um, okay. Is there anything to add? from Ms. French or Craig? I'm sorry, I don't know your last name. Hartley. Hartley, nice to meet you. Nothing to add for your okay. questions. Um, do we wanna come back to council for technical questions uh, before we go to the public? If I don't see any lights light up, then uh, we'll just go to the public. Okay, our first speaker is in the council chamber. It's Shannon McEnty, followed by Aram James online. McEntee, like John McEnroe. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know most of you, and I wanna just, first of all, say thank you for the incredible work you do for our city and welcome to the new members. And I can celebrate Lydia Ku being our mayor. Congratulations. Um, I'm here to talk on this. I wanna just say, I don't have any formal comments, but I just wanna say that I am primarily an environmentalist. I might start crying because our planet is in such trouble. And doing this thing with the leaf blowers is kind of like one of the tiniest things that we can do, but all those tiny things add up. And I hate the noise. I'm in a condo building. Uh, you, you, I hope you read the email that I sent to you just a couple of days ago. I'm in a condo building and every day, one day a week, it's my, my gardeners. Another day of the week, it's the one across the street, the Sunrise Senior Living, they come on Monday and Thursday. Every day there's this noise. Now I asked our landscape gardener to switch to electric and they did. I'm on our board of directors so I can you know, make suggestions and ask for change. Um, and I actually want to go across the street and talk to those other uh, buildings and see if they can't do the same thing. Just ask those, those, you know, it's like Janssen and those are big companies, big landscape companies. They can buy that. They can have that. All they need to do is decide to do it. Um, so the one thing that I wanted to show up, especially for tonight was to say, please include all the neighborhoods because I'm close, I think it's because I'm close to Cal Ave that I'm in, is it mixed use or commercial? And so we don't have any laws protecting us from that noise. And all of these universities and research institutions have said how much we suffer, how much of a stressor noise is. And in this case, there's such an easy solution that I really wanna uh, urge you 
to include the whole city, all of us, and not discriminate against people who live in condos or who live too close to, you know, a little business area. So that's the main thing I wanted to say. Um, and I really appreciate that you're working on how to enforce those things, how to make it easier, clearer, and be able to enforce it. So again, thank you for all you do. I'm so grateful. Thank you. And our next speaker is Aram James, followed to be followed by Jeffrey Hook. And after Mr. James speaks, we will be cutting off public comment speakers list. Yeah, so about, uh, I would say two years ago, um, we asked our gardener to stop using the, uh, the blower. I don't see the time we're going. So just so you're aware of that. Um, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to take any credit for it. Uh, I'm bad on this, but I've been educated by uh, my significant other, Donette, and um, she's an extraordinary gardener and lots of cactuses, lots of, you know, plants everywhere. She's expanded the garden that was my mom's to like twice the size. And um, so we asked our gardener to, to not go from, from go, go from gas blower to rake. Uh, and, you know, we, we paid him a lot more uh, for that because it takes longer. Um, not everybody is in that position to pay more, but, you know, the topsoil is being blown away and, and just, you know, ruining the garden you know, on top of all the noise. And uh, so, you know, I don't know what the city could do to encourage people to use the old uh, rake method and then to uh, come up with some kind of uh, compensation or assistance for seniors and others that, that don't have the funds to pay their gardener that additional money. Uh, I'm still not perfect on the issue, but um, we, we've moved a long, long way in the right direction. And I have to say, uh, I work hard every day, but uh, I, I don't have to do, I don't have to be at court at eight, eight in the morning any, any longer. So I, I, I tend to be a night owl and I stay up late, um, try to, uh, and, and I sleep in. And so it's, it's almost without fail that there's somebody in, in this subscale neighborhood uh, that, you know, there's a blower going at eight or eight fifteen in the morning. I go back to sleep over it, but I just, I just note the obnoxiousness of the sound that I didn't quite, um, you know, um, feel as much when I was, you know, bad practices myself, uh, years back here at this house. Um, so anyway, I encourage people to, to, yeah, I don't think there's a whole lot of difference in terms of the noise factor, uh, and blowing dust around between the gas blower, which does a lot more environmental damage to people, uh, and the you know the electric blower. So I'm saying let's let's where we can encourage the gardeners to and pay them more, pay them more uh, to use rakes uh, like folks did before we had uh, these other forms of uh, uh, gas and electric blowers. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Our next, spe next speaker is Jeffrey Hook. Yes, uh, hi, can you can hear me? And I also have been given minutes from the next speaker, Andrew Nepomuceno. So if I go uh, twice as long, I hope that's okay. No, and I'm I sorry, sir. You can only speak individually. You have to coordinate with a group of five people to do um, donated time. Oh, okay. Well, I have a slide deck too. I don't know if you guys can present it. I'm sorry, we have a policy. You have to send that in advance. I, I did. It was sent like yesterday morning. Sorry, we did not receive it. If you'd like, I can move to the next speaker while I try to find it. Okay. Okay, thank you. So our next speaker will be Matthew Lenning. Skip to Matthew. Okay, uh, looks like Mr. Lenning has lowered his hand. Um, our next speaker is Rebecca Sanders. Oh, good evening, council members, uh, Mayor Koo. Uh, very uh, happy to see you at the Diaz. Yeah, I just wanna say that I'm here to align myself with folks that, that agree that the LIFO blower ban should be extended to all of Palo Alto, not just the residents, but the businesses so that people who do, do live close to commercial, such as myself in Ventura, 
uh, will be uh, provided that that relief uh, from the um, uh, the noise, the, uh, the all the dust, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, also, just want to make sure that you see that all workarounds are also outlawed, like powering your electric, uh, you know, leaf blower with a say a gas powered generator, which I guess some people uh, think is okay. So, want to just close up all those loopholes when you have a chance. Uh, get that done. And yes, the noise is egregious, so I support strengthening the ordinance to include, uh, you know, decibel level, you know, protections for people's ears. Uh, and yes, my, I align myself with those who say, can't we just use the rate? But I guess that makes us all old fashioned. And I also want to say thank you to Mr. Hartley for coming over to Venture and meeting with us over here um, and just talking things over. So I'm really hoping that after, you know, 20 years or more of this on the books that we can, um, you know, make, really make it stick and show people that Palo Alto meets business. And, you know, we can, this can kind of maybe roll over into other uh, aspects of code enforcement. I'd love to just see code enforcement uh, prevail in so many areas. So thank you everybody for considering this and uh, I'm happy to listen to what other people have to say. And our next speaker is going to be David Schramm, and we will come back to Mr. Hook next. It also looks like Mr. Schramm has lowered his hand. So, uh, and so did Hillary Hunk. Um, so David Cole, it looks like you are next. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, thank you so much for taking my comments. I had written in earlier um, supporting this staff recommendation, but would like to align myself more with um, Jeffrey Hook's statements, if you have received and read those, I hope you have, I will outline a few things quickly um, about that. And the gist is to um, ban all leaf blowers, electric and gas. Electric blowers still kick up toxic dust into the air. They still make noise. Battery powered ones are quite expensive and battery life is limited. Gardeners use leaf blowers in, appropriate, in, a, in inappropriate places. Um, they blow away a lot of the leaf litter that should be left underneath plants that create mulch and humus, habitat for insects and organisms that are part of the food chain that feeds birds and other animals. Lawns can be raked. If only hardscapes were raked, this would not take too long to do. So there'd be um, not as much time taken up. Leaf litter also helps to retain moisture. We've been in drought for many years now and can't afford to use more water <laughs> and take away um, that mulch. Using an electric leaf blower instead of a gas one is kind of like driving your Tesla half a block to the post office instead of driving your SUV. Using a rake is a much more suited is much more suited to the job. Uh, we should save the precious resources that make up leaf blower equipment for electrifying other garden equipment as mandated in recent legislation that's coming up in, I think, uh, 2024. That is not so easily done by other means. Um, enforcement will be easier uh, with uh, no leaf blower at all in that people would not have to, there'd be no doubt about whether a leaf blower was gas or electric. And lastly, I'd like to please ask staff to reevaluate the ban to make all leaf blowers, gas or electric, uh, banned from residential use. This will make our residents much more quieter, be much better for the earth and for the plants and the gardens around us. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for your comments. We're returning to Jeffrey Hook for his comments. Yeah, hi, did you manage to find the slide deck? Yes, we did. Okay, awesome. Okay, honorable council members, thank you for considering the blower issue tonight. I'm here to ask you to enforce the ban on gas blowers that we've had in the books for 18 years. 
And more importantly, to ask you to consider with me why we blow it all. Next slide. Enforce the ban from 2005. That much is self-evident. Change procedures so enforcement is effective. Current procedures make validation next to impossible. Improve the 3111 app or consider allowing a citizen to snap a few photos and email them to a blower violations address. Find homeowners in preference to gardeners. The property and its owners are durable constituents of the city and are the appropriate targets for fines. And extend the ban to all city properties, not just residential. Otherwise, the city's position is ambiguous and frankly hypocritical. Best yet, and far more impactful, is to switch from gas to electric. Uh, it, it, more impactful than switching from gas to electric is to change the common standard of care from a leaf phobic to a leaf philic. I call it OHAS there, OHAS philic uh, instead of OHAS phobic because it just sounds better. Next slide. Um, the 311 app. I'm logged in, but my name and phone are not pre filled when they could be. The address is captured, but not the date and time. I've got to enter that myself. And there's no way to upload a photo on the mobile version that I can see. Isn't a photo or several photos the best evidence for a blower violation? Readily, readily available from a mobile phone, not so readily available from a desktop, yet the desktop 311 app has a photo upload and the mobile app does not, as far as I can tell. Next slide. Uh, since the invention of the blower in 1970, property owners have evolved a standard of care that is overly sanitized. Leaves are seen as unwanted trash, litter that needs to be eliminated from landscapes. Many times I've seen gardeners armed with blowers eject all leaves from under trees and shrubs, leaving the soil barren, its ability to support life degraded. How did we come to see leaves as such a problem? I've talked to many blower operators and they tell me I clear leaves because that's what the homeowner wants. If I don't do it, I'll lose the job to someone who will. The root of the problem really the blower is not with blowers lies not with the operators, but with property owners and our collective misinformation about what standard of care is healthy for our property and our neighbors. Next slide. Uh, battery blowers are not a good solution for the professional. They're costly, they're just as loud at high power, they're not as powerful, limited runtime, still kick dust in the air, do not encourage switch to an ecological standard. Why as a gardening professional do I want to spend close to $1,500 for a device that doesn't work that well on wet leaves and runs out of charge in an hour or two? A Palo Alto resident told me last week he saw a gardener using an electric blower at an apartment building while towing a diesel generator to provide the electricity. Hmm, next slide. This is a slide from a brochure I developed with a local artist. The actual brochure has, key, has a key that details each number. Here I want to emphasize the point of the brochure, which is to drastically reduce or eliminate blowers on landscapes as part of embracing the ecological standard of care. Across all facets of society, policymakers are shifting toward compliance, I'm sorry, to of evidence in science-based policy. We are realizing that we need to conform our ideas about what we want to natural law. Climate change, rainfall pattern disruption. Oop, I'm about to run out of time. Anyway, um, this is a, next slide. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, sir, you're over your time. I'm over time, oh, okay. Yes, well, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Helene Grossman. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, thanks so much, Jeffrey Hook. That was a hard act to follow, but I will try. So my name is Helene Grossman, and first I'd like to thank the council for your support in reducing noise and pollution from the gas blowers. I've seen a huge improvement in the last year, and many gardeners in my neighborhood have been switching over to electric, although, as Jeffrey Hook said, would be even better if we could switch over to not needing blowers at all. I'd also like to give a shout out to Robin Elner at the Code Enforcement Office for her diligence in sending out letters to homeowners about leaf blowers and her dedication to serving the city and answering questions. And also thank you to Craig Hartley for all of his work in the field. And I'd like to thank the council for bringing up this agenda item tonight. I believe the changes under consideration tonight will be very helpful for continuing to reduce the noise and pollution from gas leaf blowers in our community. Um, so let me share a little of my experience. I think we all wish for similar things, we want clean air, quiet neighborhoods, the ability to enjoy our, enjoy our homes and yards, but we still have a long way to go. When I'm working from home and I wanna open my window to get fresh air, I can nearly always hear a gas leaf blower somewhere off in the distance. If not at that moment, then within 10 or 20 minutes later. If I try to work on the deck in my backyard, the same thing. I might join a meeting and it's quiet and then within 15 minutes, I hear a gas leaf blower somewhere and it forces me back inside. When I go running in the morning, there's seldom a morning when I don't encounter one or more gas leaf blowers. It doesn't have to be like this. So 
So I fully support the change to allow citation upon first observed violation by a code enforcement officer. This is in line with how we treat other offenses. If you litter, if you park illegally, you can be cited right away. So we should do the same here. I believe that's the single biggest thing we can do to cut down on gas leak lower usage, since right now virtually no fines are being given out. And it could also make enforcement pay for itself. So let's let those who are violating the ordinance pay for the cost of the enforcement via fine. I also agree with allowing for citation of the property owner who hires the gardener. And lastly, I urge the city to expand the ban to all properties, residential or commercial. The distinction between residential and commercial is artificial, since in many areas of the city, commercial properties sit side by side with residential properties and residents must bear the noise. Also, the pollution to the air and the impact on the health of the gardeners themselves is the same, regardless of the property zoning. Also, as Jeffrey Hook said, you might consider some updates to the 311 app to make reporting easier. Right now you have to log in. Um, so I have to log in every single time, navigate various screens, re-enter my contact information and enter the address of the violation multiple times. It's doable, but it is somewhat laborious. So maybe the city could set up a number where residents could send a text message with the address when they encounter the violation. So thank you for all your efforts. Really appreciate all you've done and we've come a long way and really excited to see continued progress. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lynn Chiapella followed by our last speaker, Matthew Lenning. I would like to um, actually, after Jeffrey Hook's presentation, I actually think uh, rakes are a very good idea However, I do support switching to, if you're going to have leaf blowers, at least use the electric leaf blowers, they're less intrusive. And I agree with his previous speakers that it should apply to all of Palo Alto commercial areas, um, multifamily residential areas, which may be next door to commercial areas. I live in Midtown and I am affected by both commercial from the middle field, as well as the local uh, neighbors who use the leaf blowers, gas powered. But the original ordinance, which I supported in concept, turned out to be very punitive and discriminatory. Most of the property owners or those who hired the gardeners were uh, Caucasian and most of the gardeners were Latino or Asian and the fines were specifically applied to the gardener while the person who hired them went scot-free. So the most egregious example I saw in Midtown was the first gardener received a warning or a fine, so he did not come back. The property owner or employer hired a second gas blower who leaf blowing gentleman because he was so much cheaper than if he hired electric. However, this was in the very beginning and they came out and again, he was fined or given a warning and he left. So the employer then hired a third company. At that point, I realized this was a very punitive ordinance and I no longer supported it and I would not report on my neighbors or anyone else who hired someone using a gas blower, a gas um, powered blower. So I urge you to apply it citywide. I urge you to encourage people to allow litter rather than blow all of that into the street and then proceed to rake it up. Uh, if you go down to Safeway area, you will see that there's about three to four inches of topsoil missing where all of the topsoil has been blown away all the way down to the roots of the trees and there's nothing to uh, nourish those trees so please consider that when you make the final ordinance thank you thank you and our last speaker is matthew lenny <clears throat> can you hear me hello yes we can Oh, good. Okay. My name is Matthew Lennig, and I've lived in Palo Alto since 1996, and I've been a homeowner here on Lois Lane since 1998. And before council took action on leaf blower enforcement recently, I guess 11 months ago, 
All my neighbors in all directions used gasoline leaf blowers. But once the city deployed the leaf blower code inspector, it was only a matter of weeks before my neighbors had switched to electric. This has significantly improved my quality of life. So thank you, city council. And thank you to the staff of the Palo Alto Code Enforcement Office and to the new code enforcement officer. I'd also like to thank Helene Grossman for her leadership on this issue. I've read the staff report on leaf blower enforcement and the staff recommendations make a lot of sense to me. The recommendations would improve and strengthen an already effective program. I support the recommendations in the staff report. Finally, I'd like to urge city council to build on the resounding success so far in regulating leaf blowers. And please consider expanding the noise ordinance to include other gasoline powered garden tools, such as lawn mowers, hedge trimmers and edgers. These tools all use two stroke engines and they all emit uh, noxious fumes and noise pollution. They all degrade residential quality of life in Palo Alto. And also I, I agree with uh, David Cole and Jeffrey Hook and the people who were saying that we should be pro leaf and it would be even better if we could eliminate blowers completely because even the electric ones are very loud and blow a lot of dust all over the place. Thank you for taking my comment. Okay, that's our last request to speak. Thank you. Okay, we'll bring it back to council. Um, council member Vinker. Thank you, Mayor Koo. So this law has been on our books for 18 years. So it seems to me a bit of a no brainer to make it enforceable. And it seems pretty clear from the staff report and public comments that it's not practically enforceable right now with this uh, notice requirement. So I support uh, revising our code um, and I support um, applying it to owners as well. It does feel more equitable to do that. Um, and I was pleased to note in the staff report that there is some funding available to people who switch over to electric leaf blowers. And I wanted to note that, I think it was up to 70% of MSRP, um, both for the, the battery packs and the, the corded ones. Um, so that would help with uh, certainly the, uh, the gardeners who make their living this way. Um, I personally am not yet ready to ban the electric blowers, although the, the, a lot of what the speakers have said resonates with me. Um, and I would be uh, interested in hearing more about that at a future date. Um, I may be uh, one of the rare folks in Palo Alto who does her own gardening and raking is hard work. And for uh, as, as gardeners age, it is something to be taken into account, whether it's uh, uh, even more difficult for them to stay in the field. Um, so for me, uh, when I look at the uh, recommended motion, um, the, the first part of it uh, that um, I agree with items 1A uh, and B uh, to clarify that citations may be issued to the operator or the property and or the property owner um, to remove the five day notice period makes sense to me. Um, with item two uh, to have the uh, penalties um, increased to 250, 500, and 1,000. That makes sense to me. Um, and item three, uh, the public engagement strategy also. One um, revision that I would like my colleagues to consider would be to have the first year of this that there would be a warning the first time. Um, and not with a notice period, it could be immediate. And so that the, uh, the heightened schedule of fees would kick in on the second, third and fourth uh, uh, violations. Um, what I like about that is it gives this public uh, education campaign a chance to work. And it also dovetails with the 2024 ban on the sale of gas powered leaf blowers. So it's just, just a thought as to how we might do it in a way that, um, people feel that they've had appropriate notice. But uh, I want to thank staff for uh, bringing this forward. Thank you, Council Member Vinker. Um, Vice Mayor Stone. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, glad to have this 
have this back. I agree with Councilmember Vinger. Clearly, our current enforcement uh, tools are are inadequate, and I'm excited to be able to have an opportunity to revise those. So I just wanted to kind of clarify. So under the current rules, a, co a code enforcement officer actually has to observe the violation occurring. Typically, I have to observe it occurring twice. The first time we send out a so when we receive a complaint, we send out a notice of violate, uh, alleged violation. And then when I observe it the first time, we send out another notice with a, the deadline. And then so the then after I go out the second time, if I observe it a second time, then we issue a vi uh, citation. So, okay, so you actually have to see somebody with a gas powered leaf blower operating it in order to issue the first warning, and then see it again to issue a citation. I'm, I'm shocked we've even gotten three citations issued in the last three weeks with, with that. So um, surprising. So question then, uh, a larger question for staff, why haven't we outlawed gas powered leaf blowers on city property and non-residential zones? Uh, so maybe I'll take a first cut at that, uh, uh, Vice Mayor. Um, so it, it is, um, and, for gas powered leaf blowers, it is banned on, on re, in residential zones. Um, that is the that is the policy. Um, and citywide operationally, there's just it's a different um, project. Typically, uh, if you're in the open space area or in parks, there's a you know uh, think of you know Riconata, Riconata, a large uh, amount of um, uh, space that you might need to traverse, and it's it's not been something that we've um, uh, up until last year uh, hadn't had that sort of um, sort of policy direction or, or impetus to make those changes. But again, we we have made we have begun to make those changes from a city operational standpoint. Um, again, community services and public works are for the vast majority of of uh, applications are using battery pack uh, leaf blowers. Um, or electric uh, leaf blowers uh, in their in their daily operations. Great, thanks, Director Lee. And I guess the, the first part I didn't say residential; I said non-residential. So oh. in commercial zones, yes, um, I assume kind of same logic. Yeah, large parking lots. Sorry for misunderstanding you. Uh, okay. Large parking lots and um, just larger areas. If you think, for instance, like the research park, um, going out there and maintaining that that area doesn't necessarily lend itself to, um, you know other means, rakes and things and so forth. But um, again, we're, you know, that's that's just where we are at this, at this moment. Um, we haven't had that uh, direction to look citywide at this, at this time. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in favor of, of expanding that ban to city property as well as non-residential zones. I think if it's good enough to have that ban in the residential zones, we should treat ourselves the same way. I understand the logistical concerns, but this is such low hanging fruit in regards to GHG um, reduction. If we're gonna be able to meet our 80 by 30 goal. I, I know this only eliminates 0.6% of our city's overall GHG emissions, but every bit counts. And we kind of heard that message uh, earlier tonight during public comment. Um, one final thing. I'm, I'm concerned about the recommended length. I, I'm, I'm in favor of extending this to property owners. I'm concerned about the language uh, to require property owners to knowingly hire or allowing a person to use a gas powered leaf blower. Um, I think that's too easy to evade. I mean, already code enforcement is having a difficult time uh, enforcing and we need to provide them the tools. I, I think we should remove the requirement that I think we should either remove the requirement that the property owner had knowledge, or I think even better include constructive knowledge. Uh, that way, I think we can better ensure that property owners should have known by doing some reasonable level of diligence. I'd imagine most landscaping businesses don't advertise the type of the type of leaf blower they're they're using, and so just would be too simple for a property owner to be able to say, "I didn't know." Especially since so many of them are probably at work during the day when this is occurring. So uh, I think that's a simple text amendment that would would add um, a significant ease to, to code enforcement for being able to do this. Uh, I'm in favor of 
of some lead up time to give people notice of this is of, of this of this occurring but I, I don't know i think a year might be a little too long maybe 6 months or maybe just um at, at the amount of time i mean if staff is expecting this kind of education campaign to take three to six months. Maybe that's the amount of time we wait until uh, until the the actual increase in penalties uh, kicks in. But I'm I'm interested in that in that discussion. So thanks again. Looking forward to the um, to us moving forward tonight. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, Council Member Burt. Yeah, thanks. And I'm really glad that this is uh, finally coming uh, before us. Um, just a couple uh, uh, shared uh, uh, bits uh, regarding both the problem and the history. So on the problem level, as the staff reporters talked about, um, this was really uh, initially 18 years ago about uh, noise and, uh, and spread of, of uh, pesticides and um, synthetic fertilizer from one neighbor to another um, and uh, the atmospheric pollutants. Um, it's not these these are significant generation generators of ghgs but they are massive generators of uh soot and uh, nitrogen oxides and other atmospheric pollutants that's their big environmental impact other than noise um, and when we had this uh come uh, before the council 18 years ago before i even was on the council i recall that the debates um, around it. Um, and there was a real tension between being onerous on what were small, independent, uh, low income um, uh, uh, businesses and, and employees. And how did we do this in a way that would be uh, equitable and not, um, not overly uh, burdensome on them? Uh, there was an interest to go further and this was a compromise actually at the time. Something big has changed since then. At that time, the alternative to gas blowers was cord electric. Same thing on other gardening equipment. That's just the gym upstairs. Um, and um, today we have widespread availability of equipment that uses uh, battery packs. And contrary to some of the uh, statements, even in the last couple of years, we've seen on commercial scale, equipment from mowers to blowers to vacuums to uh, all kinds of the whole range of landscaping equipment now has uh, battery packs that yes they may only last an hour but what guys do is they have multiple charging stations um, and uh, they just change out batteries this is a real technology advancement that has happened and i'm really glad the state has this subsidy program um, So um, I, I did want to uh, say that I concur that I think that there should be a grace period. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I'd actually call it a grace period. I should say a warning period. Uh, I don't think a year is needed. Uh, maybe more than 90 days is needed uh, so that everybody can kind of get both the general rule and individual warning letters. And um, I think the warning letters need to be bilingual. Um, and I'm really uh, struggling with whether uh, it should require a signature of receipt that recognizes that they have understand that they've committed a violation and it's a warning. Um, and, um, uh, and I think, uh, what are the sorts of mechanisms that create something closer to self-enforcement that gets compliance without a bunch of fines? And, one of the things that was alluded to is how do we engage the property owner? I'll say that uh, when I set up our twice a month limited gardener uh, 15 years ago, at that time we had adopted this and I had an understanding that they would not use gas powered blowers. I was out of the house during the day at my office. When I finally um, uh, brought the office in house into my home, um, there I was, and lo and behold, they're using gas blowers, to my surprise. So I addressed it with the gardener, basically said, I want you to spend the same amount of time as you are currently spending, just use a rake, and I'm not worried about a few extra leaves. You don't have to get every leaf. And this goes back to this other cultural change 
that has occurred upon the invention of leaf blowers, which is that we have redefined leaves, which we love our trees, and somehow we hate our leaves. And leaves are not litter. They never historically were viewed as litter, except by a few people who really had a fetish over uh, immaculate gardens. But most of us, we don't need this. At least uh, create mulch. They're, um, they can be beautiful. They, it's just the whole notion of how many of us have, have seen these gardeners out in the street. This is public property that they're blowing on in that case, chasing five leaves. I mean, it's crazy, but somehow this has become a business and social norm. And I think we need to step back and say, there's no need to get every last leaf. And that's a lot of what has driven just the per pervasive use of this. Um, so what I do think is it needs to be coupled with the, uh, the warning is a warning to the property owner. So as soon as we see someone on a given property, we give the warning to the, um, to the gardener and the warning on the doorstep of the property owner right then and there. They have been noticed. And then from that point onward, they uh, have to accept the responsibility. Many property owners don't know, but once that occurs, they can be fined. And I think that's, that's how we're going to have a better mechanism there. Um, I was really glad to see the uh, California Corps grants laid out um, because frankly, I was going to be promoting that we look at a city subsidy and maybe we want to even supplement the state subsidy um, I don't have any problem. These are not massive dollars to do a conversion that would be uh, a great benefit environmentally and public health. And when we think about our priorities, uh, climate impacts and other environmental impacts. And, um, uh, and we, uh, we, we need to move in this direction. And then I wanna add that Eliminating gas power leaf blowers does not eliminate spreading of pesticides and synthetic fertilizers from one neighbor to another. And, um, and somehow we need to recognize that. One thing that I think would be a interim approach um, is that we say that you cannot use blowers on public property in the streetscape. That is the sidewalk, the parking strip, and the street. And we won't prohibit folks from using them on their own private property as much as I and others might like that, even prohibiting the electric, because uh, we, we really need to struggle on whether that's an appropriate step. But we own that public space, and in that public space, we don't have to allow uh, a private property owner to go into the public space and use um, a piece of equipment that's detrimental to their neighbors and the broader public. So let's think about that one. Um, and uh, one of the other things too is, I, I think there are a number of prospective referrals to policy and services committee about where we go from here. On the, not on the commercial side, uh, what we do with other landscaping equipment um, and, um, and whether, and this was a topic uh, 18 years ago of whether um, the gardener should be registered as a way to um, promote in, uh, enforcement and compliance, I should say. That's what we really want is compliance. Maybe that won't be necessary. And, and this can be something that we monitor the rollout of this. And if we have enough success, we don't need to do it, but we could have a no charge business registry and, um, and we could couple it even with the subsidies. Uh, but one of the things I'd really like to see is if we had that registry, mandatory placards, bi or trilingual, uh, that state on that they have to, any gardener in this community has to have on the truck is, here are the rules and here's the number you call if I'm violating it. And uh, how do you move toward greater self-enforcement? And I've, I've looked at and spent 30 years on environmental policy of how uh, you can have effective compliance without just uh, guns and badges. And we need to think creatively on how we can do the mechanisms that will end up with the result we want without being overly onerous. So I wanna to toss those things out. Um, when we get ready on the motion, there are some things that in addition to um, 
the staff recommendation, but related to referrals to policy and services committee for additional discussion that I'd like to put out there. Thank you. Thank you, um, Council Member Lowing. Thank you. Um, I will substantially agree with uh, Vice Mayor um, <clears throat> Stone, or particularly, maybe I should call him Attorney Stone, because I had the same uh, critical question on this issue of uh, knowingly hire. Um, and I think that that's really a wide open um, uh, fishy area. So uh, unless some other attorney can convince us, I think that that really has to go um, so that it's, 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 it's substantive. Uh, I have a clarif clarifying point to, to my, my understanding is that on, on 1A, you include the fact that citations may be issued to the leaf blower operator uh, or the property owner or both. But as I understand the first phase of this, the, uh, maybe this is wrong, but as I understand this, you're gonna actually take it only to the property owner and not be ticketing directly the operator of the equipment? Is that the intent? So uh, again, I'll jump in here. Uh, thank you, Council Member Lowing. Um, no, it's not actually. Uh, the way we would approach enforcement is that we would go after both uh, violators, unless the council has direct, uh, directs us otherwise, we would um, in, um, pursue enforcement with the gas powered uh, leaf blower operator and the property owner. Okay, because the language in 1A was obviously was confusing to me because you say or both, like you're holding that in abeyance. Well, the, the notion there is that um, there's some discretion that we want to give our code enforcement officer uh, in the field uh, in terms of, you know, the, the situation. Uh, it, it is a, um, the way it would be written, at least as contemplated, is that there would, we would have the ability to go after uh, both as violations of the code, but not necessarily would need to. Again, that could be informed by council policy if, if so directed. Okay, well, I, I think, you know, primarily the problem is the property owners. Um, and of course, they're going to have more uh, um, capability to cover the fine, uh, not the uh, not the worker, but to the point of, you know, if you're not working at home and you don't know what's going on, then, you know, then it could be unknowingly. <laughs> so I understand why that was put in there, um, but I, I, I'm, I'm just not sure it's, it's clear. So uh, I'm I could, I could clarify and, and, you know, maybe the staff report, you know, the staff report is a concept, uh, the ordinance language. Uh, I, I heard the comments um, clearly from uh, from you and, and uh, Vice Mayor Stone. We can certainly tighten up that language when the ordinance comes forward. The, the idea here is that for the reasons that have been discussed already, the property owner may not know that it's being, um, that gas powered leaf blowers are being used. And so the point is that we would have to uh, likely issue a uh, a warning letter at first to the property owner, and that would be either hand delivered or via certified mail. And then we've put them on notice. The property owner is then on notice, and then subsequent violations could be issued uh, uh, once observed. Okay. Uh, good evening. Just sorry to interrupt. Tim Shimizu, uh, Assistant City Attorney. Just to underline what Chair Late is saying, uh, notice in this case doesn't mean just what the homeowner says out loud. Oh, I didn't know, you know, if they come to a hearing. Um, our position would be is that once we have sent them a certified letter, which, you know, they have to sign for, they, we can prove that we sent you this notice. We have a note certified mail that you've received it. You are on notice now. Now, when mm -hmm. code enforcement goes back and sees a violation, we can cite you because we have proof that we've, we, the city have put you on notice. So just in terms of operationally, how that works. And I, I hear your concern about someone just coming to say an appeal hearing and saying, well, I'm never home during the day. I had no idea, you know, no one ever told me, um, you know, and there's, uh, you know, um, Vice Mayor Burt or Council Mayor, Council Member Burt raised that situation where, you know, you, you may innocently not know what's happening during the day. So it is it is sort of a middle ground. We don't wanna make it right up front, you're gonna get a citation, but we also don't want to let people out just by saying, I didn't know. Yeah, okay. Um, and then the other thing I just wanna comment on is that um, you know our goal here is to, uh, as, as Council Member Burt said, you know, if we could possibly do it is to make it self-regulatory. It's not to create a revenue stream. So 
I, I'm looking at these fines and they're pretty, uh, they're pretty steep, um, going up to a thousand bucks after the third one, which means that if they're not getting the information and they're violating it, that's probably justified. But uh, I, I'd be okay starting a little bit, a little bit lower on that. And there's a reference here on packet page 362 that, um, you know, these, these fines are not consistent with the other ones, such as littering and smoking, which is absolutely true, but we never fine for littering or smoking. So I don't think that's really a, a fair comparison. <laughs> and it's on the books, but we don't find for it. I've never seen it. Um, so I'd be okay. I mean, the idea here is to get compliance is not to, to, to raise money or get, get everybody mad. It's to get compliance. So I'd be okay if people thought a, a lower fine would be um, you know, better to start with. Um, I, I agree with a pretty short time frame, uh, but enough so that you know, we could even keep it flexible if staff thinks that it's not working after four months in terms of the, the uh, public education and the uh, uh, leaf blower folk uh, education, then they could stand, extend the, the ramp up uh, before uh, soliciting it. Uh, but in, in a perfect world, what we really want is the homeowner to sit down with the gardener and say, this is the rule, we haven't been following it. And by the way, I got good news for you. Here's all of the kinds of stuff that we can do to help buy you equipment. And hopefully the homeowner will literally help buy the equipment to show that this is you know a partnership together. And the best thing that they could do is sit down and do the paperwork that they have to file to get some of these rebates and so on for the for the gardeners. So hopefully that's the kind of spirit that we, and I know I might be a little bit optimistic there. Um, but in general, I, I favor uh, enforcement of this. It's been a problem for a long time, uh, still is, and I won't repeat the reasons why. I also agree that you know wide circulation of this in at least two languages, uh, maybe also Chinese as the uh, mayor said earlier, uh, on another issue. Uh, and this is one that was sent in by a member of the public, which I thought was pretty good. So I hope we're reading that and getting some, some good ideas on it. Thank you. Council member Lifka Haynes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, welcome to the city, Mr. Hartley. You're playing a really important role. Everybody's grateful that you're here. Um, I'm generally in favor of this. I'm not sure anyone is against it. As Shannon McEntee eloquently put it, it's a tiny thing to help the planet, but it's tiny things that are going to make the difference. I'm moved by the language of those who want the city to go blower free because it's more beneficial to the environment to let the leaves do their job as mulch and use rakes. I get it. I'm not a botanist or ecologist, but I get it. And maybe we will get there. And in the meantime, I appreciate the comments from the public and my colleagues on the fact that where in the city we try to enforce this ban is a matter of equity. Poor people are likely to live in more dense housing, which is likely to be nearer to industrial or commercial. So they are more likely to be the ones still hearing the blowers that have been banned from single family residential neighborhoods. So just as we've heard the public comment on the importance of second story ADUs being allowed throughout the city, I'd like to see us enforce a gas leaf blower ban citywide as a matter of equity for residents. I understand from staff that the timeline is to strengthen the residential ban, phase in electric and city owned places, and then maybe extend to commercial and industrial. I can't help but wonder if we wouldn't get more bang for our buck by going at all of it all at once. I agree with Vice Mayor Stone on the knowingly issue. Appreciate Council Member Bird's admonishment that we think creatively about self-compliance mechanisms. Two things that I wanna raise are I'm kind of concerned that there's a group of people who are potentially missing from the proposed revisions to the ordinance, a third set of violators. We've talked about the property owner and we've talked about the leaf blower operator, but in some instances, a third party individual or company has hired the leaf blower operator to provide these services to the property owner. So I'm wondering, unless I'm misreading the proposed changes, I'm wondering if we might add some language to the ordinance like, and the hire of said operator, if operator is employed, subcontracting or consulting for a third party landscaping firm. Reason being the operator themselves, the person doing the blowing has le the least financial privilege in the equation and the least amount of power. And I think it's important to go after those who are hiring these folks to do that work, not the property owner, the person, op the property owner, but also the person that potentially operating a landscaping business. Finally, and this is going to sound like a strange aside, but as we were, as I was reading the ordinance, I found it curious that we call out Sundays as a day that leaf blowing is banned in this city, period. That may be outdated given the diversity of our city. For many, Saturday is as sacred a day as Sunday is to others. So I'm just not sure what the rationale for that basis is or whether it should be perpetuated going forward. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I, I just want to say, uh, first, I want to say thank you very much, Mr. Hartley. I did see you at many of the um, uh, neighborhood events uh, promoting the program and 
letting people know how to reach you. So that was really great. And of course, uh, you know, continuing to let people know what to do and how to contact you. Um, I agree with most of what my colleagues have said, so I'm not going to repeat all of them. Um, although, you know, in terms of um, holding the property owner responsible, that I agree. I'm not quite sure um, if the um, landscaper themselves, um, they're, they're just trying to do their work and get moved on, moving on to their next property. They should be provided a warning and education, um, but I do think property owners should be held responsible. Um, the other part is also property managers. So many of our properties here are rentals and so forth. So I think that uh, reaching out to them, I'm sure you have already to many of the property management companies, uh, even individual property managers. Um, I even wonder, um, there's some small operations like my mine that, um, you know, we're registered with the Department of Real Estate. So maybe looking through there for property managers. And as one of the public commenters said, you know, the homeowner association property management companies who does all the hiring also. Um, another thing is I, I actually think that some of the public commenters who mentioned that we have to also broaden the ordinance to include all the other mechanisms that uh, they might use in order to supply energy to a um, leaf electric leaf bow or like having a gas powered generator or something like that. So um, if it's not already in the ordinance, I think that would be something good to add. Um, another one is um, providing electric cords, uh, extension cords to the to the gardener, so that they are able to use the electricity at the property. Um, I wanted to ask: Is there a way uh, for the micro business grants, the the ten million that's set aside? Is there a way to provide education to some of the gardeners on how they might, or property owners on how they might be able to access those grants? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, great question and, and one that I had asked uh, our staff earlier today um, to investigate that as well. So um, I don't have an answer for you, but it is something that we will uh, continue to explore. Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, so it mentions in the report that the city is also looking at um, themselves, ourselves using electric um, leaf blowers and so forth. How much time does staff anticipate they're going to need to collect information from the for the use at their at our facilities? It doesn't mention a timeline, a time. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. So, uh, so we have we have some initial data from um, our um, two departments that are are uh, principally making uh, this this shift, and um, uh, I, I believe for um, public works the transition will be um, uh, fulfilled upon um, uh, getting more. Uh, battery uh, chargers and uh, equipment. So I think it's it's if I'm under if I'm recalling correctly, it's a matter of time just before that transition takes place. And I do see that we have uh, Director uh, Eggleston on the um, call too, if he wants to clarify. For um, for our parks um, community services uh, uh, department, they um, uh, for the handheld uh, leaf blowers. The primary concern that I'm, I'm understanding uh, operationally is uh, for wet leaves. Um, very difficult for the electric uh, or battery powered leaf blowers to effectively remove wet litter. And the concern is on playgrounds or places where uh, kids or, or others might be uh, might slip. Um, that's uh, a, a safety concern that has been flagged and uh, an area where uh, gas powered leaf blowers uh, may still be used. Um, that's the data we have uh, at this point um, on that. I think that's a really good point because um, uh, wet leaves um, do pose a slipping um, uh, issue. Um, 
So on the leaf blowers, it's more, I think when we're talking about it, there's the health and noise component that is a big impact. But I wanted to find out, um, are you ever called to measure noise because of these equipments? Uh I don't know if Craig uh, wants to answer that one, but I would say typically that's a difficult um, uh, standard for us to measure in the field. Our police department has the uh, noise readers that need to be calibrated in order for us and, and maintained in order for us to be able to use them in a proceeding. Um, um, so it's uh, measuring noise, uh, especially leaf blowers, where it's so variable in terms of uh, when it's being used. Uh, it's a difficult um item to enforce. Um, Craig, um, uh, Mr. Hartley, I don't, know, I don't know if you have any more that you want to add to that. No, um, I don't have anything to add really. We haven't been asked to and generally um, we're just enforcing gas versus electric. So okay. it, the decibel level hasn't come up. Okay, thank you so much. Um, you know, I in the report, it says the chief of police approves the certificate for the commercial leaf blower uh, operators. How did that come about? Uh, I believe that may have been a reference to the staff, uh, to the municipal code section. Is that correct, Mayor? Or, I don't recall that in the... Uh, it's not. Um, wait, let me see where it is. Oh, Tim Shimizu here, just to jump in. So there is an outdate. The, the municipal code noise ordinance about leaf blowers does have a section about what council member Burt was talking about from 2005. And in, in that still extant version of our code, it does say that commercial operators shall get a certificate from the chief of police that they've been certified in the city's regulations about commercial leaf blowers in general, not just gas powered leaf blowers. Uh, I've been told today that that practice um, has faded out since in that introduction in 2005. It is, however, still on the books. Um, the city could choose to bring it back or to uh, remove it uh, with whatever to match current practice. So there's no approval needed for non-residential uh, operators then? So no, the loss, no longer. The law says there is, but the city currently doesn't have a program to do that. Okay, so I think that's something to consider to remove or or to enforce. Um, okay, um, I see Council Member Tanaka. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so question for staff. So what was the purpose of um, 1B originally to have the five day notice? Why did we have that? What was the purpose behind that? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna actually ask uh, um, Mr. Shimizu to help provide some historical context. I think it's, it has applicability for other violations that the city issues. Kim? So in the code, there's a global provision in the city's code about giving administrative citations for violations of any section of the municipal code. And in that procedure, the code says that the city has to give a five-day warning period before it can actually give a citation. In most cases, except for you know, kind of emergent health safety issues. And we take that very seriously and we do follow that. And so it, it creates an enforcement barrier to this very acute problem that Mr. Hartley has of seeing someone out in the field and then having to hopefully see them again five days later or more. So it, it it's very difficult in practice to try and do enforcement that way. Okay, because it seems like this is not just an issue for this issue, but it's an issue for other things. Like I know like parking citation is also an issue where you can't issue a parking station for, there's also, at least I was told about that on El Camino. Um, but anyways, it seems like this is not just an issue for this, but other things. So maybe it needs to be fixed for, for more things, but um, okay. Um, and then um, in terms of the topic about uh, banning blowers overall, um, I, I don't think that would be good because um, you know, so for instance, if someone has a flat roof, right, are you gonna are you gonna make them go up on a roof and start raking leaves and damage the roofs? Probably not. Um, or um, flooding, right? We had a lot of rain. You know, how are people gonna clear out large number of leaves quickly? Uh, so I don't I don't think we want to do that. Um, I, I wanted to just push in also on the the practicality of this. 
in terms of who pays the penalty because, okay, so I just want to understand the, the mechanics of how this works. So you guys will go out there and like, so it's one of the city's employees that goes out there and observes someone blowing uh, leaves with a gas blower, right? Okay. Um, okay, so I think that's good because um, because if it's self-reported or report, reported by someone else, I think it's really hard because sometimes people use like those backpack generators and they're just as loud, maybe louder. And it's hard to distinguish, is it a gas blower or is it a leaf blower, right? And so you have to be kind of somewhat tuned into that. Um, okay, so, so I'm just going to think about like my neighborhood. My neighborhood on my street, there's one gardener that does, does about half the houses on that street. And another gardener does other half of the houses, right? Um, and so if, if there's a violation, who gets fined? Is it like the 10 houses that the gardener does, all 10, 10 of them is just the gardener? How does that work? So uh, I'll maybe just, uh, in, in practice, um, Council Member Tanaka, we're not issuing them any citations, right? So it, it's not something that we're, we're actually doing. The so I mean we don't we don't have data on that hypothetical. Well, it's not hypothetical. It's actually literally my street. There's the gardeners. The gardeners don't. I don't know about other people's neighborhood, but in my neighborhood, gardener doesn't just come to your house. He he comes to your neighbor's house and the neighbor across the street. He does like a bunch of houses all at once. At least that's how it works in my neighborhood. Maybe okay. you guys are different, but but and so and so what I'm trying to understand here is logistically, how do we? Who gets penalized? Like who? So it might be helpful if I might interject, Councilman Tanaka, um, John, if you could speak to that, not historically, but as proposed yeah. in, in this uh, recommended ordinance. Yeah, so, so as recommended, uh, thank you, uh, City Manager Shikata, uh, as recommended, um, if the council were to endorse the approach laid out in, in the staff report, once the violation has been, so if, if Craig goes out on the, you know, uh, in the field and sees, uh, you know, a, um a uh, a violation taking place we know the operator we can see the operator we can take a picture and observe that and uh we know what property they're uh they're working on so there's two instances of a violation uh taking place one for the operator and one for the property owner and if craig were to sit back and and wait and see this uh, operator go to uh a uh, another property um you know that other property owner would then be uh, registered a, a violation. What I can't speak to. So uh, he's going to sit up for like a half a day and watch him go to all 10 houses and find all 10 houses. Is that how it's going to work? That, well, I'm not saying that's how it would work, but in that scenario, one, one could do that. Um, I mean, because that's, you know, we, we we're trying to change behavior here. We're trying to gain compliance and, and face, you know, remove the, the gas powered leaf blower. So, if a property owner is employing that same gardener who's using the gas powered leaf blower, then each one of those property owners, if it's their first time being noticed uh, or observed, we would send them a notice. And then the second time they would be issued um, a fine. Okay, because I think one issue that we have here is um, the gardeners are independent contractors. They, they work for a company and a homeowner, you're just one of maybe, uh, for a gardener, one of maybe a hundred houses that they're, they're doing in the, perhaps in the area, at least in my, in my streets, like they do, my, my gardener does about 10 houses on my street. And um, and so I'm just trying to understand. And, and then the other thing I, I don't understand, this thing says property owner, but on my street, I have a lot of renters and they all you know, use, you know, we all kind of share the same gardener. So they they actually are the ones paying for the gardener. So why does this say property owner, not the person who, who, who procures a service? Because like, like my neighbor, next door neighbor, he's a renter, but he procures the gardening service. So like, why would the property owner who lives in Nevada be responsible for who the gardener was or whether the guy used a gas blower or electric blower, right? So to me, it's just, it's just kind of weird. I'm, I'm just really worried about the logistics of all this because it seems like it's, it's gonna be pretty tough um, with, uh, you know, with, with how, it's, how it's set up and so yeah, I'm just thinking about the administrative burden and how this is evenly enforced. Is it just some lucky, un unlucky property owner to one of the 10 houses, you know, someone city staff is sitting out there and sees it and then all the others get off scot-free or, you know, does this guy really sit out there for half a day? And do we really want city staff sitting out there for half a day enforcing leaf blowers? I don't know. I mean, I'm just thinking about the cost involved, right? The, the so, other thing um, I'm, I'm just thinking about is, um, is uh, 
and I'm, I'm going a little bit over time, so I'm going to try to wrap up quickly here, is um, uh, I, I do agree that the fines seem really high. I mean, I don't know what, how much it is for littering, but I think this seems probably way higher than littering. This is like $1,000, right? And so it just seems obsessive, right, in terms of the, the, pen, the, the penalty. Um, so I think going after a much more self-regulated approach is much better. And then I also worry about the practicality of, for large public spaces. Can you imagine Foothills Park, you're going to use a rake? I don't know. I mean, it just seems for practical reasons, I don't know if you could ban, ban um, leaf floors altogether. This doesn't, or, or get gas powered leaf, leaf floors altogether. And the last thing I want to say is um, I'm worried about how this will impact lower income people because those are the people that could be least able to adjust to something like this. Because if you're asking someone to stack, you know, 20 power packs as they do the 20 house, you know, I don't know. It just seems like really, really tough. So anyways, I, I, I think there's a lot of logistics that need to be figured out on this, uh, this proposal. Uh, uh, through the mayor. Um, just to briefly respond to some of the uh, comments from council member Tanaka. Um, I, I, I think the hypotheticals you mentioned really just uh, put a finer point on the problem the staff is trying to address here, which is the difficulty in enforcing the ordinance that we have on the books. Admittedly, there is, there are still going to be some problems, such as the one you mentioned, where a number of property owners on one block employ the same gardener, um, or uh, you know these larger spaces. Uh, that's not something that you know this uh, proposed amendment would address. But what we are trying to address is some of the difficulty in administrative or issuing administrative citations when we do observe those violations. So uh, it, it does, you know, advance that goal. Um, and then to address your question about, you know, why we would cite, for example, the, or why we would cite possibly the property owner rather than the property management company or whomever. Or the um, renter that lives or who hired the gardener. Exactly, yes. So that, that really just reflects uh, a, a, a a general code enforcement approach toward abate, abatement of nuisances, where you can not only establish a violation on the part of whoever it is caused the nuisance, in this case, maybe a gardener or a tenant or something like that, uh, but you can also uh, establish uh, responsibility on the part of the property owner for essentially allowing that nuisance to take place on their property. And so that's, that's, that's the rationale behind additionally giving uh, 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 imposing liability upon the property owner uh, for these kinds of violations. Again, admittedly not perfect. And those are things that, uh, you know, for example, a property owner who receives a citation could raise on appeal and, and that could be sorted out sort of uh, on, on a fact basis. Um, but again, the idea here is to uh, improve staff's ability to enforce the ordinance that, are, the ordinance that is on the books and uh, the, the ask of the council here is to evaluate specifically these three recommendations with regard to how it goes about the process of enforcement. If there are additional things the council would like to, uh, the staff to undertake, uh, I, I, I think that's something that they could recommend and, and would get uh, taken up by the appropriate uh, council commission. But uh, what we are looking for and what staff is looking for with respect to this item is essentially direction on, on these three uh, proposals to amend the ordinance. Thank you. Um, Vice Mayor Stone. Thank you, Madam Mayor. For your entertaining motions, I'm prepared to make one. Yes, please. Great, if the clerk uh, received my email of the draft motion, I'm sorry, sir, I don't have your email. <clears throat> Can you resend it one time? Sure. Thank you. Let me know if you received it. It's essentially, it's, uh, and while you're hopefully while receiving that, uh, it's the staff motion with a few amendments. Uh, in 1A, it would be to add language um, I agreed with with Councilmember Lifcott Haynes to to include language of the leaf blower 
operator's employer. This is just the original staff recommendation. I'm still waiting for your email, sorry. Okay, no worries. Well, within that, it would be, um, so within 1A, mm -hmm. if we could include leaf blower operator's employer after leaf blower operator. Um, I'm interested in, you know, maybe property owner or, or renter or renter, um, don't quite know. And if we include, uh, so yeah, owner or property manager. And then A, little c. Include constructive knowledge of property owner. Yes, or property manager. To section 9.10.060F. And then number, f or I guess a D, big D. It's actually one, two, three, four. Yeah, that's what I have on my too. Uh, refer to policy and services, discussion considering whether to ban gas powered leaf blowers citywide. Council member, can I just ask whether your first comment has been accurately reflected by the clerk? Did you want the leaf blower operator employer added or nope. replacing leaf blower. Thank you. Yes, and I want it both. So it should be leaf blower operator, leaf blower operator employer. I think leaving the discretion to the officer makes sense. And open to additional languages. Can we yeah. get a second first? Oh, pardon me. Uh, Council members, Vice Mayor Stone, if I just may suggest on C, little A, little C, um, I, I think what you mean is constructive knowledge of use of gas powered leaf blower, not of just the ordinance. It's like knowledge of the ordinance existing itself. Yes. Yeah. So, so the language that I sent is a little. Yeah. So for Finish. For one little c, it should be constructive knowledge of use of gas-powered leaf blower. Do you have a second? Thank you. Yeah. Do you have a second? So, Council Member Burt seconds the motion. Um, Vice Mayor, um, would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, just, I mean, I, I, I spoke mostly to it before. I mean, of course, we cannot capture everything here. I mean, that's 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 one of the 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 I guess the the, the difficulty of of enforcement. But that doesn't mean that we that we shouldn't attempt. Um, so, I heard some some concerns from from some members, but I think this is. This will clearly allow the city to be able to enforce this ban better than we have been able to for the last 18 years. Council Member Bird, would you like to speak to your second? Um, yeah, so I, I agree with um, the general thrust of this direction. I want to uh, raise um, a prospect of uh, a few amendments. So the first is the question of whether the operator should be uh, one of the candidates to be fine. Um, so we have three kind of th circumstances uh, or entities. We've got an, 
I think probably in most circumstances, um, gardeners are employed by a small company or a large one. Um, second, uh, you, you, so then in that case, you'd, you'd be looking at either the employer or the operator. I just don't think in that circumstance, it's the operator that is responsible. Uh, and they have the least ability to pay these fines. It's really onerous. Um, I'm more concerned with uh, the employer. Um, and then you have owner operators, one person, gardening companies, landscaping, and, and then you got one in the same. The question I have is if we focused on the owner, how do we identify that entity? Uh, some cases they'll have uh, decals on trucks, maybe a good percentage of them. But if they don't, um, I, I guess I, if, if our staff is going out on enforcing and they have a, uh, an operator and there's no identification of the business owner, um, uh, maybe what we do is set it up so that the, um, the code enforcement officer can request the information on who is the employer. If that is not provided, then and only then can you cite the operator. How would that be? Yeah, I'd, I'd be fine with that. I think my, I think just my, con, my concern was, and you're kind of articulating it now, just thinking about other scenarios where let's say you were to pull over an employee for an issue on their truck, that's not their fault, you know, maybe an expired tag, you'd still have to cite that employee, but the hope with that, it would then fall back on the employer. So if staff can figure out how to include that language, I'm, I'm happy with that. Cause that's, that's the intent here is not to. Well, and even in those circumstances, the it's the owner of the truck that actually has liability, I believe. I don't know. Yeah. I, I would assume so though, you have even to still more cite the, the driver. Yeah. Um, okay. So the question is uh, within what we just showed was an inclination. This is gonna come back to the council with the details. Do we need to spell that out in the motion or uh, has that guidance given you enough to come back with some way to uh, capture that in the ordinance? Uh, yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll take that. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Member Burt. Yes, I don't think any changes are needed to the motion. We can take that and report back to the council um, sort of that hierarchy of uh, when a citation is issued for the operator uh, with the focus being on the, the business down the line eventually to the operator if, if that's the, the last course of action we have. Okay, and then we're saying that we would only begin in this new enforcement after some kind of a marketing period. So the question I have is um, we want to give a warning basically. And we kind of have two different approaches that we can take to that. One is a universal warning, try to get the word out to everybody and hope that they all understand it and they all take it seriously. That might cover it well enough. The other is individualized warnings. And that would be that upon a first infraction, there's not a penalty. There is a warning to the operator, obligation to go to the, um, the employer with that. Uh, and there is a warning issued to the property owner. Um, and so I wanna ask uh, whether there is an interest by the maker on either of those. Uh, well, whether we should stay with the kind of this universal warning that is a marketing program, or we should have a more specific warning. What about maybe a compromise of within the first six months or year, it's a warning. After that, it's the you know the universal educational campaign should have been enough. Okay, so maybe we would put in the motion to ask staff to come uh, to uh, develop uh, a. Uh, there isn't anything about the the marketing program in here right HB now, is there? Three endorse the leaf blower enforcement uh, public engagement strategy. Oh, I'm sorry, um, and uh, maybe we would add to that. Um, request for staff to return with a, um, uh, a time frame and mechanism for um, uh, individual warnings 
a single individual warning to um, uh, operators slash businesses and property owners. And Director Lake, do you think that kind of covers the compromise we just discussed? Um, I, I apologize for, for not really um, understanding the, the distinction or the, the nuance here. I mean, in, in terms of our outreach, well, one, we were based on the direction we get from, from council this evening, understanding you haven't adopted the ordinance yet, but we wanted to start our um, public outreach component sooner. Um, you know, we have, uh, if, if there was something specific that the uh, council members were interested in, I mean, we're, we're already going to be um, speaking with property owners at um, at uh, neighborhood meetings, um, we have town halls that the council has has initiated. We're going to be out in the field. Craig, uh, Mr. Hartley is going to be out in the field. Um, I mean, this is this is a big part of his job is to be out in these residential neighborhoods. Well, and if I might, if if that last part of what you described would include uh, uh, Mr. Hartley going and providing notices. Yes. where he sees the vital, uh, a warning notice in that period, then that covers what I was looking for. Thank you. That, that's what we would do. And, and uh, Council Member Burt, we were also uh, sort of thinking today that maybe even some making some door hangers that uh, Mr. Hartley can put uh, at a property owner's door just to advise them, but, you know, multi-language. Okay, that covers it, thank you. Lastly, okay. under four, um, additional referrals to policy and services, um, and, uh, it's to also evaluate, uh, replacement of ice or internal combustion engine landscaping equipment for residences, uh, and commercial properties based upon um, currently available or available technologies, replacement technologies. So we begin this process to uh, look at what's that next phase and not just leaf blowers, but we don't mandate things that aren't available. So I'm still, I'm still a little confused what, what this means. This means that we would begin to evaluate uh, not just leaf blowers, but um, banning other two-stroke mm -hmm. gas engines that are used for all kinds of residential landscaping and commercial landscaping. Gotcha. Yes, I accept that. Okay. And if I can just add, ask a question um, for clarity, and I believe this is embedded in your packet, we have a definition of residential power equipment, and it means any mechanically powered saw, sander, drill, grinder, generator, lawnmower, hedge trimmer, edger, or any other similar tool or device, except for leaf blowers, which is defined elsewhere. Um, are you interested in us being uh, really focused in on, on the landscape professional in this regard? Um, I, I, I think that that... Um, that scope captures the, the different tools. I'm interested in this being um, evaluated for the future for both uh, individual residences and commercial, yep. meaning um, uh, that would be uh, commercial multifamily units uh, as well as um, uh, other uh, in, uh, uh, other commercial properties or non-residential. Okay, all right, thank you. Lastly, um, is to uh, refer to, uh, under this referral to policy and services, evaluation of decibel levels for equipment. And, you know, we could, the, the electric leaf blowers, um, in some cases are lower decibel or in higher pitch or, or not, but there is a range and I, I began to look at kind of what's available and um, and this may be something that we're going to want to incorporate as well going forward. Uh, we talk about noise and we uh, 
uh, may be fooling ourselves if we think that converting to electric is necessarily going to solve the noise issue. Uh, but I don't know the right numbers, and and we have to look at what are what's competitive equipment that may be lower decibel and uh, of available technologies. Yep, I accept that. Okay, thank you. Council Member Venker. Thank you. Um, I'm generally supportive of this motion. I had a couple of friend, what I think are friendly amendments. I wanted to, uh, uh, you invited some um, phrasing suggestions earlier. I just have a couple small ones. Um, the first is in 1A, where we're, after we get past the leaf blower operator and the operator's employer, um, it, perhaps we should say the property owner, comma, comma, manager, comma, renter, or other person authorizing or employing the use. Because really we're talking about whoever authorizes it. I mean, Council Member Tanaka was giving the example of where some renters are the ones who hire it. So I think whoever it is that actually hires, authorizes, says, go ahead with this leaf blower is the person we're looking for. So I'm trying to make th that, sub, you know, that this, this, the nature of the person um, there, whereas where the uh, owner, manager, renter are examples, but really we're talking about the person authorizing the use on their property. That's um, fine. Is that all right? Okay. Then um, the other is, um, you, you both talked about um, supporting the public engagement strategy, which we've learned includes both the general um, education strategy and the specific notices, uh, which are in the forms of warnings. So what I'm wondering is if in paragraph two, uh, if we do wanna have a grace period, if that would be the place to say, um, direct staff to prepare a resolution updating the municipal penalty schedule effective and have some date, you know, however many months out. You, we, you've convinced me maybe we don't need a full year. So six months gets us to August. If we said August 31st or October, or September 1st, something like that. So these penalties would become effective at that point. So that what that does is it gives us a time period to do the public engagement strategy that includes the individual warnings. Would that be acceptable to the maker? Uh, yeah, it's probably, I mean, I, I assume staff, if staff need this uh, estimate on how, what, when this will come back in the first place, I'd imagine it'll be a few months. Hmm. Yeah, we, so we're hoping to have this uh, back for um, council adoption before your summer break. Okay, yeah, so then August, what was your language? Like um, August. 31st? So six months would be in August, so I was just putting the end of August or September 1st. We're past the summer there too, so when you, know, you have some heavy you know, use of gardening. That's fine, effective September 1st? Sure, okay. I don't know if the second or... Great, yeah. except. Um, sorry, just one clarification. Yeah. Um, so there, technically, there are already penalties that exist for this violation, and the ones that are being proposed are increases. Yes. So just to clarify that if you want like a grace period with no penalties at all, so zeroing them out until a certain date, or you just don't want them to increase until, say, whatever. Just the, the increase would not become effective. So we would be having the penalties effective immediately is what you're saying? Just the lower ones? The, yeah, the, whatever the current penalty schedule is would remain in effect. Um, as I think through that, um, we're really saying that the current system of uh, this five-day notice is really not uh, a good way to go. Um, and I wonder whether we should, while we're ramping up the program, we go ahead and just put in abeyance the current penalty system, unless we have kind of frequent and, frequent and flagrant violators. And I don't know if that's something that, that staff is struggling with how to needing this tool. Would you want to still, may I ask uh, Mr. Hartley that question? Yeah. Um, would you want to be able to retain the current penalty system while we have this 
um, six month marketing and grace period? Yes, I think we would still need to have some type of penalty in place. Thank you. So are we clear where we're at now with the motion? It's so the updated penalty schedule would not become effective until September, but we would maintain the current salary, sorry, the current penalty schedule. Right. So, so if we just say updating the municipal penalty schedule effective September 1st, that would leave in place the current process um, with the five day notice and the, the current level of penalties. So I, I think that, so is that acceptable? Yes. And sorry, just one more clarification. So the, the five day notice is a different part of this motion. So we are still proposing to get rid of that effective whenever this ordinance would go away. I know we're kind of talking about different things, but the same things. <laughs> well, why don't, so then, yeah, so now that's an excellent point. So yeah. maybe we could have a timing element to 1B, you know, remove effective September 1st, <laughs> the existing requirement. And then, so on September 1st, it shifts where you no longer have the delay and you have the increased penalties. Would that solve the issue you raised? Yeah, just to, just as long as everyone's clear when different things trigger. So if that's what you'd like, that's totally fine. We can, if, the, if that's what the council would like, we can write it that way. Yeah, let me articulate it and then I'll stop talking and see if they like it, um, I, to see if I've got it right. So if we say um, remove in, in 1B, remove effective September 1st, the existing requirement. Um, and then we have, uh, I don't know if it's in here yet, on two, to update the municipal penalty schedule effective September 1st, then what would happen is we'll stay in the current state until September 1st. So you, Mr. Hartley can continue to enforce this code in the way he has been. And then on September 1st, the five day waiting period goes away and the fines increase. Is that correct? How that would read? Okay. That's what I would suggest. And that's all I have. <laughs> Is it acceptable to maker and seconder? Maker is contemplating. I am contemplating. <laughs> so, and, I'm, and I'm sorry, while that contemplation is no, taking place, I'm, Thank you. I'm still trying to, uh, the, the, confused about the five day, uh, that, is, that is a significant limiting factor in our enforcement ability. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned ab about we're stalling that uh, that change again. Council policy and, and your call. Um, I guess I'm not understanding the benefit of retaining that. I and if I could uh, perhaps um, reinforce that perspective, I think what we're hearing from the council and the interest expressed. Understand the council still needs to vote on this. Is a desire to have a, a relatively we'll call it a, a phase in period, and at the same time by defining these dates you may actually may slow this down more than we were able to move. In, in its um, component parts, I think the, the easiest piece to come back with will be the ordinance. I think we've basically got the ordinance and we're simply changing some of the definitions. If you give us a sense of the period of, what did we call it? The warning period, the warm-up period, phase-in period. Uh, then staff perhaps can move as quickly as we can to bring that back, perhaps and hopefully beating this September first uh, date. That said, number four is a significant body of work uh, that will need to be uh, reconciled with other uh, priorities that will both hit PNS as well as the staff work plan. But to the extent we've heard an interest in in moving on this ordinance, I think we'd like some flexibility to be able to move that even quicker. Great, I, I, thank you. Oh, sorry. Oh. I, I just, I, so I actually, that was the intent was to slow it down. The, to, to slow down the date of effectiveness of the higher penalties. Um, and if it were up to me, I would have, uh, I would continue to remove the five day notice period, but I, I don't, that's not what I'm hearing from Actually, I think Mr. Hartley or my colleagues. So I was trying to go with that. And I think that's 
So that's why that is like that. I see. But obviously it's up to my colleagues as to what they do. No, and you. I appreciate the feedback from Director Late and the city manager. I I won't accept that. I think I think the I think the I think it I, I think it makes sense to to slightly delay the increase in penalties for those who are going to fall in between that that window there of right before our summer break and September first. Uh, um, I think and that might fair enough that some people who might not be fully aware of of this uh, updated ordinance will get hit with a lesser fine. And then hopefully in those notifications that might go out at that time too, we could also make it very clear starting September 1st or whenever these fines will also be increasing as well. So I think it accomplishes it without further pushing this back. So um, 1B, the word September 1 is not accepted? Correct. Okay. So this um, 1B should re remove the existing requirement, take away the parentheses to provide a five-day notice of violation warning the operator of gas-powered leaf blower and slash or property owner in advance of issuing a citation for violating the ban. Okay. Uh, the other one, number two, is that accepted effective September 1, 2023? That was accepted. All right, very good. Um, next, council member Lowing. Um, I had a question uh, quite a while ago and, and it's kind of gotten more complex since then. So um, I, I was gonna suggest that the uh, word in number, words in number four, we, uh, sorry, that in number four, where you say, uh, consider a band on gas blower leaf gas powered leaf blower citywide. Um, why couldn't we just you know, add that to the language tonight and pass it? Then when it came to the second parts of it, if you want to refer anything to policy and services, I would think it would be the rest of it, presuming that there's some other data to be studied and that got more complicated when we were going after noise and, and things like that. So I, I was just wondering why tonight we couldn't just put the uh, ban on gas powered leaf blower citywide and vote on that and have a separate motion to vote on, uh, to send the rest of it to uh, PNS. Yes, uh, through the mayor. So council member allowing, I, I do have an easy answer to that question. And it is that the agenda item this evening is only noticed uh, as uh, proposed amendments to the ban on gas power leaf blowers in residential zones. And so if we were to take action sort of broader than that, uh, I would be concerned about a potential Brown Act violation, but also just fairness to folks who might have an interest in their commercial operations or okay. uh, Good. Know, that, 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 other that, aspects beyond the residential users. That's a good ad. Can, may I add? Yeah, you want to uh, respond? Yes. So in addition to that legal noticing requirement and, and kind of due process there, um, there's also things that we don't necessarily know about uh, existing available technologies. We know that for yards, there are good technologies, the backpack ones, uh, but we need to respect what we don't know. My general concern is that, you know, this has been out of implied for a long time. And, you know, there's a lot of good discussion tonight about getting this thing going. Uh, and now we may have to de delay it months more um and on, on on the basics that we're all in favor of so that's why i was just trying to accelerate it a little bit yeah i'll just say going back the 18 years there were a whole bunch of ramifications that weren't thought through when the when the initiative was put forward and then there was months of kind of backpedaling and and back and forth and learning i think uh we have there are there are a number of implications of some of the things that i want to do uh, or at least pursue but I respect that that we need to have stakeholders uh, uh, not only at the table, but hear whether there are uh, any significant uh, barriers to being able to accomplish what we want to accomplish. Thank you. Um, Council Member Lau, are you done? Okay, Council Member Tanaka. Yeah, um, so just back to 1B, I actually think that, um, 
council member Vinker got it right, just in terms of pushing it back, just because I think this is fairly substantial change. And I don't think we want a bunch of upset people in our city. And so I think trading carefully on it and making sure that there's enough um, warning to people, I think is important. So I would actually support what she was trying to do earlier. Um, okay, one question for, um, for uh, staff is how much is a littering fine right now? How much do people pay? How much is a fine? Yeah, I think it's I think it's aligning with that. So two fifty for uh, first violation. And and how much more after after that? I, I think it follows the schedule that is on the screen. Um, two fifty five hundred one thousand. So, um, okay, so this this is exactly the littering fine right now. Is what we're seeing here. That, that's my recollection, council member, is, um, that we were aligning it to those other uh, penalty schedules. Okay. Can okay. Well, I guess. If, if it's not right, let me know. Um, the second question is, how much was their fines before? So before this change, what was what, what was the penalty schedule? I don't have that information readily available. Um, it's it's in the staff report, it says 100, 150, and 300. Okay, so- um, I'm sorry, for the, I thought you meant for the other citations. Yes, thank you, whoever commented on that. Can't okay. <laughs> okay. So these these penalties are way higher. Um, I I'm reluctant to go so high on them because I just feel that you know one thing it's one thing about littering where you're you're you're, you're there's a kind of a um, you know definitely I don't think anyone would agree with that right um, and then this which to me is is more minor than littering is it has a, like a much bigger penalty and so I think the penalty is not commensurate with the offense. Uh, it just seems it just seems outrageously large to me. Um, so I, I I don't I don't think I could support that part. Um, okay, and then um, on C one C, um, constructive knowledge. What does that mean? I I don't understand the legal implications. What does that mean? A constructive knowledge. Can someone answer that? What does constructive knowledge mean? So it, okay. if I understand, Council Member Stone. Vice Mayor, excuse me, Vice Mayor Stone correctly. There's a concern about the word knowledge in the, in our staff report and what that means to, um, you know, potential violators wiggling out of that. I think one way of dealing with that is, as Councilmember Burt said, is and that we've suggested is giving literally giving notice by mail once we observe a violation. I think that we would interpret 1C at least as I would understand it as seeing if we can go further than that and cite without doing that potentially. Uh, we would have to look into that how, and think consider how we would operationalize that. But it does give us something to consider in drafting this ordinance. Wait, so C means that we don't, wait, so I, I, missed, what, I missed what you said. So you're saying that with constructive knowledge, we don't have, even, even have to give people notice and they just get fined right away. Is that what you're saying? So we don't have to give people. We wouldn't to. We wouldn't have to send people a letter saying that putting them on actual notice. So is there a way? I think that Vice Mayor Stone is interested in asking staff, or staff finding a way of doing if staff don't have to do that. But but constructive knowledge means okay so maybe should this be should just should be consider including constructive knowledge yeah. because it's not like you're not even sure if this is possible. So um, are you uh, making an amendment? If, if I can no, I'm trying to understand the take a first. stab at this. Um, currently, as written, the ordinance prohibits or talks in terms of no person shall operate, and the the, the problem with the ordinance as written is it makes it difficult to hold anyone other than the person holding the leaf blower responsible for this violation, okay. so to speak. What staff proposed is an amendment to expand liability to those who knowingly hire or allow a person to use a leaf blower. So not just the, the person holding the leaf blower equipment, but anyone who knowingly hires them. 
the concern expressed by the council earlier was, well, how do we know that this person knew their gardener was using a gas powered leaf blower? And so Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor Stone uh, suggested uh, relaxing the proposed amendment from a no from knowingly hiring to anyone with constructive knowledge, meaning if we tell them, tell a property owner through this notice that we observed their gardener using a gas powered leaf blower, they cannot then say, I didn't know a gas powered, they, they use a gas powered leaf blower because we have told them they have used gas. But what if the homeowner? That is, so that, I, that's constructive knowledge, right? We we told them mm -hmm. that we observed okay, this. But that's different what you said earlier, which is we don't have to give them notice. But you were saying is we're going to give them notice that that that's issues happening. Separate, separate, separate issue. So, so this is how the the this issue of constructive knowledge addresses how we go about proving a violation has occurred. Either we witness someone using a leaf blower or we tell a property owner, someone you hired or someone on your property was using a gas powered leaf blower and therefore you can be held responsible for violating our leaf blower ordinance. So that, that's sort of proving the violation of the ordinance. The five day requirement is separate. That is a procedural requirement okay. that says before we issue any ordinance or any violation, we have to send be a certified mail, this uh, uh, notice to the property owner that we observe the violation. And if we see it again, we're going to issue a citation. So uh, I, that, that's the difference between B and C. Um, I'm seeing some nods. I'm also seeing some puzzled looks. So let me know if yeah, there's an additional it's, clarification it's, I can provide there. It's a little bit complex, to be honest. Um, it, it is, admittedly. And so, um, yeah, so uh, because the, the scenario I'm thinking about is uh, whoever hired the, the gardener has them sign a contract saying, do not use gas leaf floors. Sometimes sends them text messages, do not use gas leaf floors, and they use it. So is that, is that person hiring the gardener in trouble then still after, you know, having written notice to the gardener saying don't use gas leaf floor? Because like, Unless you're expecting whoever hired the gardener to sit there and watch the gardener as they do the gardening, which is, I think, unrealistic. Yes. If we then go back and tell that property owner, we witnessed your gardener using a gas power leaf blower. So what is the, what is the person hiring them? Are they supposed to sit there and police the gardener themselves? I mean, they, they, they tell them by text, they have them sign a contract. I mean, what more are they supposed to do? Councilmember Tanaka, if you would like to make an amendment, please make the amendment and okay. let's see if the maker yeah, and the second. I'm going over time. So let's, let's, because uh, let me... we're going through scenarios yeah, I understand. and. Yeah, I yeah. understand. Okay. Um, so, uh, for, so the fines, I think the fines are too high here. Um, I'll, be, I'll be interested in something lower, um, maybe just a little bit higher than the littering fines, but not like, like uh, going from 100 to 1,000. That just seems like way, it seems excessive to me. Um, so I don't know if the, uh, Maker and second would be open to something like that. Do you have a proposal? Um, so maybe like ten percent higher. I don't think ten x higher is, is right. So maybe ten percent higher than the current fees, but I don't think a ten x higher is make is like is right here. No, no. I mean, you talk about commensurate to to littering. I mean, the California Air Resources Board mentions that one hour use of these is equivalent to driving okay. okay. 1,100 no. miles in a Camry. On. So this okay. is commensurate. That's fine. Okay, it's rejected. That's fine. Um, the, the one thing I want to ask about staff here is, um, like I see four, it says ban on internal combustion resident, uh, internal combustion engines. Are we talking about cars here too? Because that seems awful broad. I mean, it seems crazy broad here. Or is, just this, is, is it just referring to like, yeah, it's not just by refined to, to leaf floors. What is it? I think it seems force is awful broad in replacement. Of it's not referring engine. to cars. Okay, then we should say that because it seems awfully broad to me. It's in the context of the entirety of this discussion, which had no reference whatsoever to vehicles. 
Okay, well, I, I think unless it's changed, I, I don't think I can support that one. Um, and let's see. And then last thing here is the cost of enforcement. How much does staff think this is going to cost to enforce? How much does staff think it's going to what? Cost to enforce all of this. Cost of enforcement. Well, that's effectively the cost of the staff we have handling the program. So our inspector and uh, relatively speaking, any indirect cost for uh, the outreach and as that has been described. Okay, I was looking for like a dollar figure. Mr. Late or anyone have a specific dollar figure? If not, we do not have it available at this moment. I, I don't, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's one FTE. The, the council had um, uh, um, created this position and uh, with the focus and attention on leaf blower enforcement. So we're trying to follow through on the council's direction. We're hampered by the existing code and we're suggesting some changes that we can improve our efficiency. Thank you very much. Um, council member Lifkot Hames. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I appreciate this conversation. I know we're going late into the night. I just have not been able to stop thinking about renters as we've been having this conversation. Uh, I don't know what it is, 45, 46% of our city rents. And it occurs to me that as we contemplate the enforcement of this ordinance more effectively, renters are quite differently situated power-wise vis-a-vis owners. Um, if a renter, for example, is in a, a, a a home that is owned by a commercial landlord who has employed a commercial landscaping person. The renter may not feel that they're in any position to call out violations of this ordinance. They may fear retaliation. They may fear unjust eviction. So I'm wondering if the maker would um, entertain a friendly amendment to item three. I do believe it is in the section on public outreach and awareness where we could essentially direct staff um, to in this to, to, all right, let me see if I can do this. Um, so endorse the leaf blower enforcement public engagement strategy present, presented in this report and direct staff to provide renters with a confidential method of reporting violations to guard against retaliatory behavior or threat of eviction. I'm not sure that I, 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 I'm just feeling the need to acknowledge that they really are quite differently situated. And those of us who own we can call on a neighbor, I'm hearing this noise, but if you're in a home where the ordinance is being violated, you do not have the same sense of standing or permission to speak about it as you would if you owned that place. So that's what I wanna offer the maker and the seconder. Is the, is the current process I mean, public in that way that, it's, that it would be recorded the the complainant, and that would be reported to the to the owner. That's so, the case. I support this. I just don't know if it's necessary. We we accept um, anonymous complaints, and we'll follow up on those. If somebody provides a name, um, it, it may get you know provided. You know, it might be part of a public record, but somebody does not need to provide their name. Okay, thank you. So, with that understanding, is it withdrawn? Yes, I'll withdraw it. I do hope that as we consider renter protections going forward, we will take this kind of thing into account as an example of how they're differently situated, but I appreciate it's not appropriate for here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Vinker. Yes, thank you, Mayor Koo. Um, I will attempt to do this quickly because I don't want to get back into a long conversation, but I do want to address the knowledge point. Um, so first of all, I, maybe I'm missing it, but I don't see knowledge as a requirement in 9.10.060F. And I didn't see it in the motion. I did see it in the staff report about a, an operator or owner knowingly um, having a gas powered uh, blower. Um, so what I'm wondering is, can we just eliminate the need uh, just take out knowingly altogether, constructive or otherwise, um, unless I'm missing something in the ordinance that we're trying to amend. 
I don't know if either our attorney or, or, or the maker had something in mind, but I, I don't know if we're adding, it, it appears to me here we may be adding a constructive knowledge requirement and I had thought the intent was to take away the knowingly provision. I mean, the, 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 well, the intent as it is now is, is that it would be knowledge or constructive knowledge. But do we... Was, was that, I thought that was, uh, that staff had described that that would be based upon a, um, uh, a notice that was signed, acknowledgement of a, a, by the property owner or property manager. But if knowledge is not a requirement, you don't need that. That's my point. Like, do we do we philosophically right, feel we need them to have? Yeah. So I I would say that I I don't want to find people who don't know that there's a violation occurring on their behalf. Does the yeah. city attorney have anything to add? Uh, yes. So it is true that the motion does not contain the the knowledge requirement. Uh, stated in the staff recommendation, I, I think we would read C, one C of the motion as uh, a wordsmithing of the uh, recommendation part 1A. Um, however, if there is discomfort around that, alternative language we could use would be something, let's see, uh, if you refer to packet page 367, very bottom, it's a preceding code section 9.10030, which deals with residential property noise limits. The first clause of Subsection A reads, no person shall produce, suffer, or allow to be produced. We could use that type of uh, language around the use of leaf blowers, and that gets us essentially to the same place. This, the phrase produce, suffer, or allow to be produced would address the person operating the leaf blower the person who hired the leaf blower or the person who maybe hired that operator or anyone else who allowed that to take place. So essentially a property owner. And, and that, that language is, is fairly consistent with public nuisance type ordinances. Yeah, so, so I agree, but I, I thought that went more toward A, which is why I had offered the property owner, manager, renter, or other person authorizing language earlier. Okay. But with respect to knowledge, um, if I'm concerned about the temporal aspect, because if you want the constructive knowledge so that someone knows first, but I think what we're saying is we send it to them along with their hundred dollar fine, because we're just eliminated the five day notice period that I was trying to put off earlier. Is that correct? Can I, can I interject please? So, so this, this whole concept is based on this idea that the operator knows they're in violation because they're holding the gas powered leaf blower. The right. property owner, as in council member Burt's example, comes home one day and finds out that somebody's using a gas powered leaf blower. We want to go through the process of giving them notice. We will give them a notice uh, in person, or we will send them a certified mail notice that says, Hey, we've observed this. And you're now on notice that you're not allowed to, um, uh, employ or have somebody use a gas powered leaf blower uh, in this zone. So that is our, that's the, that's the knowledge that's being conveyed from the city to the property owner. And the next time then we, we have, we observe a violation, then we've satisfied that need to give them advanced notice. And then we can cite them. We will not cite the property owner in the first go. We I will see. first give that certified mail or that hand delivered notice. That's I what see. we're trying to do with the ordinance. So we're trying, we have a dichotomy between the operator has the fine immediately and the property owner is not fined until after, till essentially the second time. Is that correct? Correct, because the property owner may not know. 
Okay, I did no, not. That's why we give them a certified mail or a hand delivered notice that says you're you're we're giving you notice that this is a violation. And next time we see it, we're going to cite. I see. May I ask a question? Because I thought that in this um, how the city manager this warning period uh, that that applied to the operator as well as the property owner that in that period, the operator would be receiving uh, a warning uh, in writing. Uh, is that not the case? Not, not with the way that we're, when we, we eliminate the five day notice, we can, the, the point is to be able to cite upon observation of the violation. That's, that is the intent. Uh -huh. And so the way we've got this set up, an employee operator uh, making low wage uh, could be, is the only one who would be cited immediately. Could be cited immediately, yes. Yeah, I got a real concern with that. I am too. That's why I was trying to get at that point. I think that it should be consistent between the owner and the operator. If we want to give notice, then let's give notice. If we don't, then, I, you know, the, the property owner, uh, you know, starts with the low fine. This is why I wanted the, the six month period um, beforehand so that we can let everybody know the owners, our residents, the people here in Palo Alto to understand that this should not be happening on their property or they should not be, if they're renters, hiring people to come into their homes that do this. And um, if we give them warnings over the next six months and then we're like, okay, everybody, whether you're the operator, the employer of the operator or the person who had it, them come into your property, now we're, now we're gonna find you. That's yeah, I had spoken about the issue of providing the operators with a written notice. And I didn't realize that was precluded by um, the way the staff proposal had it. So uh, it's, not, it's not precluded. I'm sorry to interrupt. It's not precluded. It's just that the city would have the ability to also cite uh, at first violation. Okay. So how do we give enough direction to just not be willy nilly here? So a couple couple things. One is I think um, you, I know you got at least a, one or two other items on your agenda that probably deserve some focus. Um, and we don't even have an ordinance before you right now. So I, I feel like we've received a lot of direction from the, the council. We understand the equity concern. Um, and uh, we can we can continue to explore how that might evolve. There's one way where we would write the ordinance, but then we would also get direction on how we might enforce the uh, the regulations. And we can do that in a manner that uh, is consistent with the council's interests to make sure that the folks that are getting cited are the ones that um, ought to be cited as opposed to perhaps the operator. Uh, so that uh, sounds good. So in the interest of moving it along, if when this returns to us as an ordinance, uh, we can have uh, some opportunity to discuss enforcement at that time. That's right. And, and we can present some options to uh, help guide that conversation. Okay, so so we would have noticed, so we would treat similarly both the employer of the operator and the owner of the home because they would essentially both get constructive notice. We will discuss neither... that when it yeah. comes back with the ordinance, a discussion around enforcement. Okay, then my second point, which is very fast, is just that uh, I might suggest that in item four, where we say refer to PNS, uh, discussion of the ban on gas powered leaf blower citywide and evaluate replacement of internal combustion uh, engines for residences and commercial properties maintenance. I don't know if you'd accept the word maintenance, but we might get another vote if we did. That's okay, fine. thank you. That's all, thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Stone. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, just one kind of, I think the the process that director late described with actually having to mail out a mail notice to the property owner that's not constructive knowledge that's actual knowledge so that's inconsistent with with this motion that was i mean my intent was to treat them the same and that was the idea of constructive knowledge is you knew or should have known that you were violating this uh this ordinance and how could you know you simply ask the the landscaper when you hire them, do you only use, do you use gas powered leaf blowers? They say no. Okay, so 
that just wanted to clarify that language there. And yeah, I agree. I was a little confused as I think as council member Bert, as far as that exchange on the timeline here with the leaf blower enforcement and the public engagement and when these things will happen. So if when that can come back to us, um, that needs to be uh, cleared up. So I just wanted to clarify those two things. Okay, very good. So um, the point also is that this is going to be returning to us. It's not going to be enacted right now. So it's still coming back to us. So um, let's call the question and take votes now. Oh, I'm sorry. Council Member Tanaka. Really quick, on 1A, I think on the second to last line of 1A, this is or both, but I think it should say or all. Maybe that's a better way of, because there's more than just like a whole list of people. I don't yeah, know if that's fine. Okay, great. And then um, I, uh, I can support a lot of this, but I can't support 1B or 2. Um, so I, I was wondering if the mayor could split the motion. City Attorney, can I split the motion? Give me one second. I I would just not sure they're separable in my own mind in terms of what uh, they they fit together as a package. So one uh, B and two. So uh, under the council protocols and, and procedures handbook on a division of question, you, you can, uh, if, if a motion contains two or more divisible propositions, each of which is capable of standing as a complete proposition, if the others are removed, you can split. So I, I, I think here you could, since we are talking about this procedural requirement around the five day notice of violation and the amount of the fines, um, and, uh, and, and you could vote on them separately. I, okay, Madam Clerk. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can, you can vote on them separately. Thank you. Okay. Shall we start off with this one? Um, take the votes, please. Councilmember Lowing? Yes. Councilmember Tanaka? No. Mayor Koo? Yes. Councilmember Vinker? No. Councilmember Burt? Uh, yes. I, do I have this right? Am I... <laughs> yeah, it says. It's the motion is uh, it well it's no the it's, motion's not by Tanaka. No. Oh. It's, okay, so it's just it's just so the it's separation. Just split out a separate. Okay. So the, it's really the mayor's decision on okay. separating. So it's just a motion to approve these items okay. individually. Okay, got it. Okay. Councilmember Lowing. Oh, sorry, I said that line. Um Councilmember Lithcott Hames. Yes. And Councilmember Stone. Yes. Motion carries five to two. Very good. And then we go back to the rest of the motion. And just for clarification, so does this get incorporated into the original motion? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Here's the full motion, including the two elements we just voted on. Uh, Councilmember Burt? Yes. Uh, Mayor Koo? Yes. 
Council Member Lowing? Yes. Council Member Lithcott Hames? Yes. Council Member Stone? Yes. Council Member Tanaka? Yes. Council Member Vinker? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Um, do you, does anybody need a break? Okay. Five minutes, please. 10.01. Mr. Kelly.
Members, can we get you back on the desk? I'm about to use my gavel. <laughs> Mayor, I think you need to your gavel. Yeah, we got there. You need to like pound on the table there. Oh, seriously. Mayor, this is your gavel. This is like. So, do we have a quorum right now with the four of us? Yes. All right. So, let's get going. Yeah, let's get this done. Okay, I have a question to ask council members. We're at 10 o'clock right now, and usually we do a check-in if we can take on a new topic. And so I wanna know if we wanna defer this and actually add a um, weekend day, maybe Saturday, but uh, let me um, let city manager sure. Ricardo um, say. I'm, I'm curious what happened to the rest of your council. Do we we have a quorum. Okay, so so the question was uh, recognizing there is no way we can actually get through this item tonight. Uh, to recognize that um, you likely need to schedule a special session, whether it be to schedule another Saturday session. And again, this is specifically on the objectives because you you do have time sensitive business on your other agendas and continuing to have a domino effect just is really disruptive to the business of the city. The other alternative would be to start your meeting earlier in on a Monday, say at 1 p.m. or sometime in the afternoon to enable more time. So again, we're really uh, just proposing some options to help you uh, get through uh, what is becoming something of a backlog. Yeah, and um, I want to take this time to apologize to the members of the public. I know some of you have been around um, throughout the meeting, but starting a new topic at this hour um, is going to take too long. And so we have to kind of think about this logically and practically and think about another day. And I'm sorry, we had three of us who were still out of the room. We didn't realize you were starting. Uh, but would it, sometimes what we do is uh, allow members of the public to speak to the item only. Is that what you were already talking um, about? I haven't talked about that yet, but I was going to ask council if they would be open to a Saturday or starting a, a meeting earlier so that staff can prepare. Um, what would be the um, preference? Uh, Council Member, oh, Vice Mayor Stone. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, I'd, I'd prefer either a Saturday session or an earlier start on Monday. I wouldn't be able to do earlier than 3.30, but that'd be my preference. And and have pub, and take public comment tonight. Uh, Council Member Burke. No? Oh, okay. I'd, I'd be game on either one. Okay. Uh, Council Member Lowing? I'm fine with either one of those. Yeah. Council Member Tanaka? Uh, I would prefer a uh, Saturday. Um, Council Member Lescott Haynes? I would prefer a Monday. Yes. <laughs> Council Member Banker? I apologize, I wasn't back. I don't know what the question is. Question is, uh, would you would you prefer a Saturday meeting or a earlier start on a Monday? Oh, for this agenda item following up on the retreat? I'm fine either way. Okay. So it sounds like there's a majority for either way. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Madam Clerk, maybe a doodle poll? Thank you. And um, we will take public comments on this topic. Okay, our first speaker is in person and it is John Kelly followed by Jennifer Landisman. Mayor Koo, Vice Mayor Stone, um, I don't know who to, whom to thank, but 
I appreciate you taking down the sign about the mask. So thank you, someone. Uh, during the time when I left and when I came back, I sent you all a letter. I presume that you haven't had a chance to read it, and I'm not even going to try to summarize it right now. Uh, but I would ask that you read it before your next session. And I would one of the things I started off talking about was public participation. I personally think it's great that you allow people who want to speak and not come back to speak to you tonight. But I think it's not really great when you open a public hearing or have public comment, and then you foreclose people from speaking when you take up the issue again. I just think that's a bad way to do business. Uh, so if you're gonna allow me to talk tonight, I'll introduce the topics I wanna to speak about, but I think it's much more meaningful if you're a member of the, of the public to be able to say something to you at the time when you're functionally making the decision. Um, so on the public participation points, they were really very brief. I think you should let people who are providing care to other people speak at any time during the meeting, during public comments. And I think you should also try to group the issues before the council in the way that you've kind of done with your agenda. I have a number of points that I made in my letter having to do with the topic of global warming. I think the one that's probably um, least discussed in your proposals or the two of them are the whole question of stranded assets, which I think is a terribly complex, but still, very, very important issue for the city. Uh, one sub point on that is I really do think that the city ought to retrain the workforce that's gonna be put out of place. And I think those are the people who should be installing the things that we're gonna install. I've advocated for a municipal carbon tax for a long time. I wanna make it clear that I think it should be progressive, both in terms of income and wealth. I think that should be part of your action plan on climate. I have a number of issues uh, as to housing. Uh, probably in the remaining 50 seconds that I would have, I would say the two most important are that staff should be given leave to enforce state laws the way that staff thinks they should be enforced. I think the council's done a lot of things that are contrary to that. And while I support 100% the ability of all of you to advocate for, for changes in state law, I don't think it's appropriate for the council to in way, shape or form, tell the staff, bring us proposals that don't comply with, stat, with state law. I think if you particularly look at the kind of the round robin cycles we've gone through, especially on ADUs, it's been, excuse my language, a joke. So let's follow state law. I'm sure you're all committed to doing that. I have a lot more to say if I'm allowed to say more the next time you meet. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Jennifer Landisman, followed by Carrie Yavkin. Um, Mayor Ku, Vice Mayor Stone, Council, thank you for all you do and staying up late and having these long meetings. Um, I applaud the item for the establishment of an airplane noise committee. It would be very welcome news and a uh, very, very meaningful step to many of your constituents. It was confusing to me, and so maybe it could be clarified for when you actually discuss the item, that the mini packet um, also has new items added to a 2023 work plan for airplane noise, and how that connects to the airplane noise committee is unclear. Um, the work plan item says to, to work with the SFO roundtable and GBAS, which are actually not new items. So they're under a headline as new, and so that could should be clarified. And what I would what the the issue itself was best described by Vice Mayor Stone at the retreat when he um, mentioned that the need is to engage SFO and uh, federal regulators. Engaging with SFO and the FAA on the FAA's implementation of next gen technologies, of which GBUS is one of them would also better reflect the city's resolution 9543 on airplane noise. In the work plan or committee um, objectives or focus to the SFO round, if the uh, work plan committee or the objective is limited to the SFO round table, please note that the SFO round table only has resources to pay attention to nighttime noise or other noise for San Mateo and San Francisco. And we, didn't, we need attention for Palo Alto and the Mid-Peninsula. They also focus on the loudness of flights 
and not on the number of flights from concentrated routes. So I hope that you will not narrow the objective, focus or work plan for 2023 solely to the SFO Roundtable and GBAS. I realize that the work plan item states other opportunities, but including the appropriate agencies in charge of noise in the language for your efforts to inform you, it just would be better. Thank you. Okay, and our next speaker is Carrie Arkin, followed by Mark Schul online. Um, good evening, Mayor Ku and council members. I was listening to all the gas blower uh, information and your motion, and I think a lot of this um, noisy and nox noxious fumes could be related to airplanes and what SFO has done with next gen making us the arrivals um, route over um, going into SFO Palo Alto is the arrivals route for uh, overland so. Um, I hope that um, you can form a airplane noise committee, which I think would be great. And that would help to formalize all these ad hoc little committees or meetings or get togethers. And then um, then the um, it just seems like it's been sporadic and that would help um, citywide. And it would show the citizens like myself who've been kind of involved with airplane noise that you're actually doing something that you have a committee that you've formed that you're you know, gonna have meetings, regular meetings and get something done or show some progress. Um, you need to hold F the FAA and SFO to be accountable to our city, to our citizens, because they dumped those very spread out routes to one line, mostly one line over Palo Alto. And for those of us who may not be so concerned about leaf blowers, if we have we're, we're under that line of the Congo line of planes or uh, jets, and especially the loaded jets from Europe, the big heavy ones, we're, it's, we're inundated. There's no escape. I mean, the leaf blower, it's like one day, Tuesday, Thursday, it's over here and Friday. So I have three different, like half an hour, that's it. But the planes, that's, you know, I sometimes 5.30 or as soon as they start in the morning, 6 a.m., you can get one from Iceland coming in. Um, they've never measured particulate matter, which I think might um, help us in our um, in our work to get something done. Uh, I also wanted to bring up noisy noxious fumes, Caltrain. I don't know if you know that they use diesel, gasoline, and compressed natural gas. That is very noxious, and they're very loud. Um, Palo Alto Airport, another leader here, they use leaded fuel. Those, a lot of the small planes are running on leaded fuel. So that will be coming up when you deal with the Palo Alto Airport. Um, so I said, fine particle um, matter from the large jets from the arrivals route have, has not been measured. And it might be good to get some kind of a measurement or some kind of a baseline. Um, let's see. Da, 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 uh, so please help us restore our beautiful, our once beautiful skies to be quiet, healthy, and clean once again. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next speaker is Mark Schull. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Air traffic into SFO is now heavily concentrated over Palo Alto. Some of this is due to the FAA, but is also due to 50 years of traffic shaping by the SFO Roundtable. In 1999, when SFO conducted tests over Palo Alto for its dual landing system, there were approximately 70 flights per day and the average altitude is 5,400 feet. Today, there are nearly 250 flights per day and altitudes range between 3,000 and 4,000 feet. SFO has grown, but not that, but in terms of operations, but not by that much. Palo Alto had no input into any of the changes involved in this growth. The FAA relies on roundtables to fine tune where traffic is located. And for 50 years, the SFO roundtable has done this with no consideration of or representation from Palo Alto. The FAA's reliance on the SFO's, uh, SFO roundtable for direction is particularly problematic because it's operated by, the, by San Mateo County, not the airport itself, which is the norm. It was essentially created as part of land use and building permit negotiations between the airport and the county 
which is why it's operated by the San Mateo County Building and Planning Department. In 1997, land use related negotiations included a revision to the Airport County MOU that opened membership to quote, all cities in San Mateo County, regardless of noise impact, unquote, but excluded those outside the county, no matter the impact. I think Palo Alto needs to take a stand on this. The F SFO Roundtable is federally funded under what is called Part 150, which requires expenditures to be tied to impact and equity. Part 150 funds are not supposed to be a block grant to San Mateo County to do as they wish. It would be great if we could simply go around the round table, but SFO's master plan requires it to coordinate with the public through its round table and FAA regulations reinforce this. We have asked for membership for 25 years. I think it is now time the city take more assertive action, including legal, to gain a full seat at the table in matters related to SFO traffic over us. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Rebecca Ward. Good evening, council members. Uh, first of all, Mayor Ku and Vice Mayor Stone, I would like to thank you for your, all your efforts to try to address the problem of concentrated SFO jet traffic over Palo Alto. However, it has been seven years since the FAA implemented NextGen and the concentration has only worsened over those years. Bluntly, Converging SFO arrival traffic has been shifted beyond the border of San Mateo County and into Palo Alto where the airport and FAA literally ignore it. For example, the surfer route from the south cuts diagonally across Palo Alto and is heavily used. The airport has documented surfer has serious problems. To fly the surfer route, pilots need to use speed brakes, flaps, and early landing gear deployment. This creates excessive noise over Palo Alto, yet the FAA and airport have done absolutely nothing to address the road. Additionally, SFO's gated community roundtable has blocked Palo Alto from membership for 25 years, ensuring that we don't have an equal voice. So it's no surprise SFO's arriving traffic has moved south over Palo Alto. For too long, the FAA and SFO have been allowed to ignore the severe concentration of SFO arrivals in Palo Alto. Jet noise and ultrafine particulate matter emitted by planes are both harmful. You don't see particulate matter, but it gets trapped in the air we breathe. Ultrafines are especially dangerous. Further, many studies have demonstrated the adverse effects of exposure to aircraft noise on health, such as annoyance, sleep disturbance, cardiovascular disease, and alteration of cognitive performances among children. Concentrated jet traffic is not one of those things that if you ignore it, it's not harmful. I sincerely appreciate that you are looking to take steps to mitigate the problem. The city has depended on residents for their advocacy, knowledge, and proposals. That only goes so far. The city needs its own expertise, legal, technical lobbying. You also need an overarching plan to deal with the problem on multiple fronts. Please treat this as the serious health and safety issue it is and apply the needed resources to remediate it. Thank you very much for your time. Our next speaker is Karen P. Hi, this is Karen Porter. I appreciate that one of the proposed objectives under the community health and safety priority is the implementation of a quote strategy for the provision and promotion of unleaded fuel at Palo Alto Airport. The major project update for tonight's meeting does include a description of the city's effort to encourage use of unleaded fuel by piston engine aircraft, as well as a progress report. It shows significant steps in a positive direction. While I commend the city for this action, ongoing lead emissions from incoming and outgoing flights at Palo Alto Airport are continuing to harm people and the environment. East Palo Alto bears much of this burden as flights typically take off over that community. Everyone knows that lead is bad, especially for children's health. The language of the proposed objective leaves open the possibility that aircraft operators could simply decline to switch to unleaded. California's Attorney General recently weighed in on this subject, 
In a comment letter to the Environmental Protection Agency, the AG states that lead aviation fuel poses serious public health and environmental justice concerns. Therefore, actually stopping the availability of lead fuel in the very near future, future is critical, as Santa Clara County has already done for its general aviation airports. Accordingly, I ask that the proposed objective on this topic be amended to specify a definitive plan and timeline for ending the sale of lead fuel at Palo Alto Airport. Short of that, the city should report the registration numbers and owners of all aircraft that continue to operate on leaded fuel and thereby pose a serious health threat to the community, in the words of the AG. I would also add that if a committee is formed to address jet noise and emissions, which I support, its scope should include Palo Alto Airport. Thanks. Our next speaker is Dashiel Leeds. Hello, my name is Dashiel Leeds. I'm the conservation organizer for the Sierra Club Loma Prieta chapter, also speaking tonight on behalf of Sierra Club's Bay Alive campaign. Thank you for adding the natural environment to your 2023 priorities. Protecting, maintaining, and enhancing the health and longevity of the city's vital biodiversity and natural assets is a fundamental stewardship obligation, and it is all the more crucial in the face of climate change and as the community's human footprint grows. We ask you to consider the following clarifying objectives for the 2023 climate change and natural environment priority that advance concrete action in the following issue areas. Number one, sea level rise and groundwater rise adaptation plan work on this important chapter of the SCAP, which has not begun yet, and there is currently no mention of it in the staff report on the 2023 work plan items. Number two, strong creek corridor protections in open space and citywide. This objective should include both flood protection, flood protection and riparian habitat protection. A key action would be adopting an ordinance, implementing the comprehensive plan policy and programs on creek setbacks. Number three, stewardship of habitat and biodiversity in the baylands and other open space preserves. Protection and enhancement of our natural ecosystems are key to community resilience and sustainability. Number four, light pollution and bird safety to protect public health and environmental health and protect migratory species, including birds in Palo Alto. Key actions could include an ordinance, development standards, and public education to motivate and help community members become part of the solution. And number five, continue to lead and accelerate work towards the equitable electrification of existing buildings and reducing emissions from transportation. Gas pipelines have no future in our society, so let's move away from these stranded assets. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Aram James. Okay, so let me start out with, we had 1,100, almost 1,200 police killings this year, the most on record. That's two years post the killing of George Floyd. We've had some brutal executions this year of Keenan Anderson, uh, tortured to death after a car stop by the LAPD by way of tasers. And of course, the Tyree, I'm sorry, Keenan Anderson and then uh, Tyree Nichols, brutal, brutal killing in, in Memphis. We are far from any kind of meaningful police reform in this country. Uh, there was pushback and we went back and we've got to make this issue a number one priority again this year. The Palo Alto Police Department, as I've said repeatedly, has a systemic history of racism. We have the Black Lives Matter lawsuit folks. We've got, uh, <coughs> we have uh, the, 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 the problem that the police chief thumbs his nose at, at the RIPA data that's come out. He doesn't believe there's racism in the police department, doesn't want to root it out. Um, and we have Captain Zach Pavone, who's now been 10 years. It's been almost 10 years, nine years to be a, a, a exact. And we still carry him. And he's nothing's been done with his racist statement to Marcus Barbour. Appalling, what are we gonna do? We've got to keep that issue as a priority. Secondly, we have lots of pronouncements throughout the years about anti-Semitism, stands that we have to take on that, um, Holocaust Remembrance Days. I'm a Jew. My grandfather was the youngest of 19 Ukrainian Jews, graduated from Cornell in 1930. You can come over and see the scrapbook. My father uh, was born Daniel Benezer Fink and changed his name to Stephen D. James 
So you can figure it out for yourself. Legitimately, a Jew don't like anti-Semitism, but we have got to recognize the Palestinian human rights. I believe our failure to do that is creating more and more anti-Semitism, making uh, Jews the, the target of all sorts of problems. If we don't treat the Palestinians uh, fairly, then that's, that's a huge problem. We need to have a referendum in this town, a resolution supporting the human rights of Palestinian people. Third, I tried the uh, nuclear weapons case in 1979, 44 years ago, involving defendants, my clients, that walked across to protest the production of the Triton missile, a first strike weapon. We still have those weapons being built in our backyards. Talk about one, uh, uh, you, you we're talking about first strike, first strike weapons in violation of international law. I sent you in Ray Weller that I litigated for about seven years post the trial. We have to also consider that Sunnyvale Missile in Space is still building first strike weapons in our backyard, potentially the ultimate climate disaster. Thank you. Those three things have got to be top priorities. And our final speaker is Ken Horowitz. Who would like to defer his comments to the next meeting. Thank you. Um, and uh, with that, we're going to move to a, to adjourn. But I'd like to adjourn our meeting in memory and honor of Melissa Batten Caswell. Thank you. And again, thank you for everybody for being here. <laughs>